Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 39 of the Friday Nightmares podcast. On this episode, we are talking about children's horror stories. I am one half your hosting team this evening, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, waxed, back from vacation, and ready to be called daddy. And if you can, please get me wet and feed me after midnight. <laughs> Coming out with Scott's new rock, rock album. That's actually where we've been for the last couple of weeks. Scott's been recording his upcoming LP drop. Rocking out with my cock out. (laughs) Feed me after midnight. Um, And for the listeners who don't know who this is, because it's been so long, it's Heather Powell coming to you from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. Uh, We're just coming back from, I guess you could say a summer break, but it was only a couple of weeks, but it probably feels like a lot more since we recorded. I guess it's been almost a month. Yeah, I'll say, I think it's been about four weeks or so. Right. So we did our slasher episode. Um, Hopefully everybody enjoyed that. That was with Nudie. Uh, We did our top five slashers and that was a lot of fun. We're going to have more of those top five episodes coming out as the rest of the year progresses. Scott came back from his UP trip for everyone who's not from Michigan. Uh, The UP is the Upper Peninsula and it is up, I don't know, like seven hours away and Scott went up there and hashtag lived his best life for a week. Yeah, I would say just pretty much relaxing it up, enjoying nature, swimming mm-hmm. in the lake every single day, jumping nude. in the sauna. I nude. wish I could. I wish I could be nude. I'd probably oh, scare yeah, all they're... the buddies away that I was around. <laughs> yeah, they'd be. Well, they'd be intimidated, Scott, more than anything. That's what would happen. That's true. I'd be. I'd be like, <laughs> hey guys, check this out. Kickstand. <laughs> they'd be like, oh, not only does he have all the magic cards, he also has a big dick. <laughs> it did be really, really and traumatic. don't forget, don't forget dozens of listeners. Dozens of <laughs> listeners. That's what you and hey, we both have dozens of listeners. Let's we not do. get to so thank you to our dozens of listeners who continue to download and listen we to love you all. and I um <laughs> talk about random shit. We really do appreciate it. So uh, this episode, I think you introduced it, is children's horror stories. Did you introduce it? Yeah. Okay. Fuck. See, <laughs> can you tell? Again, like, <laughs> you can so tell. Risky. You can t- You can tell we're back to back to it because Heather's already not paying attention to me. Well, I thought <laughs> you did, but then like, yeah, I kind of just got so excited to be back recording with you that I guess I couldn't remember five seconds ago. Um, or maybe it's because I took a look at our 2021 watch list and I was like, holy fuck, we watched a lot of movies uh, that we have to talk about. Well, more like you watched a lot and I watched a couple. <laughs> yes, you were away, so you couldn't. I had a staycation, um, so I did a lot of partying. Finally went back to the movie theaters for one of my watches on here. Movie theaters have opened in Ontario. Uh, so that was really awesome. Pretty pumped for another movie theater watch that's coming up soon at the end of this at the end of this uh, month. Candyman. Yes. Um, and I'm sorry, Scott. How many more days is it till Halloween? I'm I'm just not sure. I haven't looked on Facebook today to be reminded. Ah, uh, I'm not sure. Probably. Oh like- no, Scott. We're not real horror fans if we're not counting down the days till Halloween. I don't count down the days till Halloween till October. <laughs> is it okay? You? I thought you did a September countdown. Well, I, I used to do that with when I did my like first time watches. It'd be like first time watches, blah, blah, blah. It started in September and yeah. October. But all I do now is first time watches. <laughs> so I don't do. pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we're watching it for um, like an, a, an episode, like a show or something like that. Like right. We have to watch something again. Oh, so man. It is- Sorry, no, go ahead. I was just about to say, uh, and we are recording on Friday the 13th. Are you going to watch? Oh my God. Are you going to be such a fucking basic boy bitch and watch fucking Friday the 13th movies after this? Um, meh, maybe. Might watch some 2021s. You know what you should do? We should do tonight. We should watch the television series Friday the 13th just to be like different from everybody else and then post all the episodes that we're watching from the Friday the 13th series. Yes. Action. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch all the Halloween movies tonight. Oh, even better. And and then say, <laughs> oh man, isn't Jason great in Halloween too? <laughs> all the horror fans like, 
we go from like zero to like I don't know however subscribers we have on our Facebook page like nobody in the group they're right, all like, like everyone's like yep we're done they're all like <laughs> fuck these guys I feel like so much stuff has happened over the last month but then I get on to talk to you and I'm like pulling a blank of anything that I possibly wanted to talk about isn't that brutal like I was I like know. oh man I gotta remember this really funny thing that happened that I'm gonna share with Scott on Friday Nightmares and now I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. The only thing, actually, the only thing I'm regretting is I haven't seen M. Night Shyamalan's old. And, oh, yeah. Um, I can't find anyone to go to the movie theater with me. And just because of timing, I haven't had a chance to go to the theater yet. And I really want to see it, but everyone's shitting on it. No one's liking M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong's new movie. <laughs> I'm sure it's got a twist. What did you say? I said, I'm sure it's got a twist. Oh, twist. I thought you said, like, I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Do you want to see it? I'm curious about it. I seen the preview for it and I'm like, huh, this looks very interesting. And it looks like very M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. And I'll say, like I'm it, all it, about checking right? out his movies. So that and Candyman, uh, we're going to talk about some 2021 movies that came out on Netflix as well and our main topic. So that will kind of be fun to review those. I'm going to Canada's Wonderland tomorrow, and uh, I'm going to be <laughs> riding some roller coasters. Yeah, you, you are. My fucking 38 year old ass getting up on these fucking roller coasters should be pretty entertaining. You're going to be getting um, done off the roller coaster, going, "Ow, my back, my back, <laughs> my, back. my hips, my tum tum." <laughs> Anybody have any tums? Anyone have any Pepto? What about some gravel? Yeah, I should. I feel like I should pack all that shit with me, like in a little fanny pack that I walk around the park with. <laughs> <laughs> you know and i have my little fanny that i could take out and do stuff with but this time like i was saying to my i love it when you earlier, take out your fanny everyone loves it when i take out my <laughs> fanny. um no no one more than me um but i was saying to my girlfriends they're like teasing me right they're like oh man like because i used to be a real daredevil right like i would go on every ride didn't matter how scary it was didn't matter how big it was I would go on it. Even so much so, I went to Wet and Wild, which is a water park, everybody, just so yeah. we're clear. It's an American chain up here in Canada. And there's a capsule water slide where you step in and the ground um, is removed from underneath you. It drops and it completely free falls you, drops you. And going up to the top of the slide, I was like talking smack, right? To the chick I was going up with. I'm like, yeah, man, this is nothing. I'm not even scared. I got into that fucking castle, Scott. And honestly, I'm like, I regret my decision. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in there and they make you cross your arms, cross your feet. You have to lean up against the wall. And it's literally, you're looking down and you're like, this floor, floor is going to go out. Like it's going to drop me free fall. And I'm just going to fall and they count down right so they lock you in the capsule they close the door and lock you in there and then they walk back over so you have to watch them walk over to the launch pad they push a button and then you hear three two one launch and the fucking floor moves around underneath you and you fucking free fall and honestly I'm pretty tough but I was like I got off that ride and I was shaking because it was it was so quick this ride was this water slide was quite tall but because you free fall, you're going so fast. Like you don't even realize how fast you're going. I opened my eyes at one point and all I could just see was water in them. Like I couldn't see anything because we were going so quickly. I couldn't even like react to what was going on around me. Um, That's crazy. It was crazy. So, you know, I'm wondering how Wonderland's going to go. Cause when I was a young Heather, so you can imagine if I'm doing that shit at 38, what I was doing at fucking 18, right? right. Um, I would go on roller coasters three or four times in a row. Didn't matter how tall, didn't matter how fast. I still did it. Now I'm all like, do I really want to go on that roller coaster? <laughs> how much, like already um, I'm going and I'm like, okay, I'm not going on any spinny, spinny rides. Like I'm not, going, <laughs> like I'm choosing the ride so I can last the maximum amount of the day. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing my trauma tomorrow and how that goes. I cannot um, wait to hear about it. And even my girlfriends are like, oh, are you going to smoke tomorrow before you go on the rides? I'm like, oh. are you fucking insane? I'm not going to fucking smoke weed and then go on a roller coaster. 
What do I look like, a 17 year old to you? I fucking can't handle it. Oh, that you. would be horrible. I can barely handle some weed sometimes when I smoke it in my backyard. I can't imagine how I would feel going on a fucking roller coaster doing that. Oh, that'd be, um, that would be insane. It would be insane. So that's kind of like the most quote unquote fun things I have done and a bunch of fires and stuff. But you were really living it up. I'm so glad you had a great time away. Um, rest, relax, swam, um, engaged in some beverages, engaged in some other things. Oh, you, yeah, Scotty seen... got pretty drunk and high. A couple I was pretty though. proud of you. I'm not going to lie. Every time that you told me you were drunk and high, I, I just responded with, I'm so proud of you. Um, <laughs> you know why? You deserve to have a good time, Scott. I know. I was like, like it, it was uh, very nice to just get away, escape, and just chill. And, and when, sorry, go oh, ahead. I was going to ask you, and aren't you proud of me saying that I, uh, I needed this? I didn't post that anywhere. No. Oh my God. Last year. I so needed this. I'm like, shut the fuck up, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no, this year I probably would have like understood it a bit more because you've had some interesting experiences, but I guess we should make a pretty big announcement if it's able to happen. So as we all know, borders have officially opened. Yeah. Canadians can go over to the United States through land and flight for social reasons. Uh, oh, sorry, no, my mistake. Americans can come here through land and flight for social reasons, any reasons they want. Uh, so the plan is that Scotty, hopefully um, providing no major issues and we can figure out exactly what he needs to do for a COVID test. He needs to have one before he comes into Canada, but we need to figure out if he needs one to go back because America hasn't officially opened their land borders for tourism until August 21st. Yep. So hopefully Mr. Biden will make a decision or President Biden will make a decision on uh, what the requirements will be. If uh, Scotty will have to get a COVID test here before he goes back, which will mean his nostril will get violated twice. Violated twice. Um, but yes, so Hopefully, fingers crossed, everything goes as planned. And I think we're planning, what, the 17th to the 19th, Scotty? Something like that, yeah. That's I think we're that's thinking. what we were going to shoot for was the middle of September. Um, yeah. Let's just hope this Delta variant doesn't fucking ruin it for everybody. You unvaccinated bastards, go yeah. get your vaccine. Like, I don't know, if you're listening to our podcast and you haven't got the vaccine and it's not because of a medical reason... Um, and I'm careful when I say religious reasons, I do want to respect your people's religions, but please consider it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a pretty good idea, but that aside, hopefully, I, I don't think things will close. I think um, hopefully the U.S. So I, no, Scott, I could fly into the States right now. If I wanted to fly in, I could. I would just have to get a COVID test before I arrived and before I come back. So that's what we have to figure out with Scott. And then I have to figure out how much a COVID test will cost him. It's a lot of work, but Scotty's worth it. Aww. Scotty is worth it. We have and we have so many fun plans. We're gonna go on a ghost walk, like a real ghost walk. Like Scott and I are just are gonna fucking walk around like it's great. Ghost, like it's- ghost. <laughs> like, imagine we go to some fucking ghetto high school and we're walking around it, and that's what you do when you come up here. <laughs> Hi, I'm a white boy with a camera. Walking around spooky <laughs> man in some, place. Like, shitty found footage film. We go to all the targets so we can look at the fucking like ghost of Target Pass in Canada. Um <laughs> Anyway, and then we're going to be going out to a bar and then we're going to go to Niagara Falls and we're going to go to Screamers, which makes me want to pee pee my pants, but <laughs> we'll see if we can get through it. Uh, if not, maybe Scott and I will check it out and go to one of the other baby haunted houses. Who knows? <laughs> uh, hopefully meet up with Christian and Vince as well from the TGIF uh, fan Friday fan podcast and possibly Dave C, depending on what the requirements are. Um, in order to come back to Canada. I don't know how much he's going to want to get, you know, swabbed in one day to just come over for an afternoon. So, right. Right. So fingers crossed it's going to happen. We've been planning it. Uh, this is supposed to be for Scotty's big birthday. I don't know if you want to say how old you're going to be, Scott. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be 32. No. <laughs> I'm going to be hitting 40. So, uh, yeah, my birthday is October 8th. So, yep. It'd be sweet to celebrate a little early with you and then hopefully celebrate with a friend of the show, Liz, later on as well. Yes, a friend of the show. Yes. Not a personal friend of ours at all, Scott. <laughs> She's only friends with Friday Night Nights podcast. You know what I mean. <laughs> I know, I'm just grazing you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm so excited that hopefully Scotty can come up. I, I want to introduce him to my friends and take him around and 
more than anything, one of the biggest things I started talking to him about was the amount of weed we were going to smoke and the amount of drinking that we were going to do. And like the drinks I was going to bring on the ghost walk tour that we're going to pay for. So we have roadies and yeah, then the free drinking we're going to go have here before we go. <laughs> just to give everybody an example of how planned Heather really is. <laughs> she's asking me, okay, so what type of uh, booze would you like to have for our pre-drink game? Like before we go out and uh, actually hit up the bar. Would you prefer beer and what kind of beer? Um, I'll pick it up before you get here. And blah, blah, blah. I know <laughs> this like, woman knows liquor. how to plan. I, out to I was going to get like, so this everyone knows when I go out, I go out. So I'm going to get us disposable plastic coffee cups or water bottles from the dollar store. And I was said, I'll make you a mixed drink or a beer and we'll bring it with us for roadies in the cab. And also <laughs> when we walk around on this ghost tour and like, I'm going to have pre-roll joints. It's going to be, we're going to be lit. <laughs> so you guys, if he comes up here, we will be going live tons. I am sure of it. Yep, we're going to look like live, Dan we'll and definitely Lacey, share. only not as good looking. <laughs> like, like we're going to be the Dollar Tree version <laughs> of Dan and Lacey. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be freaking hilarious. Funny. Hopefully will at least be funny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed that it works, man. It's been a year and a half since Scotty and I have seen each other in person. I was actually thinking as I was eating lunch today, oh my God, we started this show two months before the pandemic happened. Yeah. The rest of the time we have been in COVID mode recording this fucking show. Um, so I'm really excited for him to come up here. Super excited to go through screamers because I'm going to have to woman up and try to get through this fucking haunted house, especially if Vincent Christian are with us. I don't know. I'm going to scream. It's going to be terrifying. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's so exciting. And it's my girlfriend's birthday that weekend. So Scotty will be there for her birthday as well. So we'll be able to rip it up. Hell yeah, um, it's going to be so much fun. It will be a lot of fun. So anyway, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully that happens. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> we go day by day here on Friday Nightmares. Right? <laughs> like we at least have an idea. Like before yes. we were just like, oh, we can shoot for this day. It's like, nope. Now we actually have a date set in stone. Now we just wait to make sure it all goes accordingly. <laughs> I think it will be fine. I think the only thing we have to figure out is if you need a COVID test to come home. Yeah. And the cheapest place I can find that for you to get it. Now, mind yeah. you, you're bringing over your rich American dollars. So it yeah. goes I mean, a lot further here. Maybe we can find somebody to do it in a back alley for us. Hey, and they'd be the <laughs> most polite back alley ever. Um, yes. And I had to break it to Scott. I'm like, there's still a mask mandate here. And like, they take it seriously. Like, you'll get kicked out if you don't put on a mask. <laughs> so make sure you bring one because... If you try to walk into a place without a mask, A, either a customer will say something to you or the sir will ask you to leave. Like, it's that fucking serious. See, like, why? <laughs> I wish America would be like that. And we're both fully vaxxed, both Scott and I. So just so everyone knows, we are fully vaxxed and um, healthy, I guess. Well, well, well besides healthy, our aches and shit. Yeah. But I was like, going to say, well, we don't well, have COVID. That's relative. <laughs> <laughs> you know, besides Scott's bad hip and my tennis elbow. Otherwise, <laughs> my sciatica, we're doing okay. You know, we just don't have COVID, but everything else. Right. We have, right? Um, so I um, guess we should get into our 2021 movies. Uh, unless you want to talk about anything else that's coming up this month or anything you're excited for. Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, speaking of... Uh, friend of the show and friend oh yeah of just ours. a friend of the show did you hear that liz i just want you to know liz that you're my friend well maybe not if, scott's but you're my friend Liz. if you would let me finish as I a know. friend of the show I'm... and friend of ours mm -hmm. <laughs> liz will be coming to visit uh visit here at the uh and well by the time everybody hears us in about a week uh so yeah we're gonna be hanging out gonna take her around uh the exciting places of michigan we're gonna hang oh, out man. watch the movies eat some yum yum food, hang out, and have a great time. Mm. Man, there's nothing a little more than eating. <laughs> oh, eating's amazing. Are you going to take her to that Mexican restaurant that you said you were going to take me to, but then never happened? <sighs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys will take pictures, and I'll just be so happy for you that I, I'll just say something to you privately later that she can't see. Um, <laughs> but you know what? You are a fun time, Scott. She is going to have so much fun visiting you. Um, I do miss visiting you very much. Aww, so I, I do. I do. 
Um, you know, it's, it's sad. It really is. But at the same time, you got to come to Canada now anyways, because A, it's a fucking lot easier to come to Canada. And um, yeah, we're going to have a great time. We're going to rip it up hard. Yep. And come here. I'll say finally, the Friday Nightmares comes back together and parties it up. Oh man. And two years almost after knowing each other. So it's cool because when we hung out before, we only knew each other for a couple of months. Now yeah. I think we know each other so well that we can text something and we can read the subtext behind the text. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like you were saying, when we were recording the show, literally we only recorded two shows in person and then pandemic hit. Yeah. And we just kept our, now we talk on the phone all the time. Like, let's make something clear here. Scott and I just don't talk yeah. when we record. I'm sure people have put together that we're besties for life. And we talk basically every day, I think yeah. almost. And if, on the phone, at least five to six days a week um on average even if it's for a couple of minutes yep but i would say generally speaking oh yeah yeah like even when i was on vacation you were still hearing from me absolutely well we have a little group chat with brandon it's this little threesome we have of love that we have that we we call all the time facebook messenger is great for that too oh it is right all right let's get into these 2021s before people turn off this podcast and we'll get into the first one <laughs> Uh, the Boy Behind the Door. So this is an 88-minute movie. It is available on Shutter. Um, basically, the short synopsis is, after Bobby and his best friend Kevin are kidnapped and taken to a stranger's house in the middle of nowhere, Bobby manages to escape, but he goes back for his friend. So what did you think of this one, Scotty? I really enjoyed this one. Um, I've seen where it is on your list, so it's not as high for me as it was for you. Yeah, I moved it to number one. I don't even know oh. if I was just that, like, yeah. Oh, it wasn't even at number, number one when I seen it uh, last night. Yeah. Oh, sorry. My lie. It's number nine. I don't know why yeah. I said it was number one. It's number nine. Never mind. Yeah, I I, I really enjoyed it. Like, uh, I thought the acting all around was very solid. It had a very creepy, tense atmosphere to it. Um, The idea, be or like, just the plot of this story is just kind of fucked up and creepy, just with the whole kid kidnapping of children mm -hmm. um, and what they're being used for yeah it's yeah. pretty it's, it's hard to kind of put your mind around that yeah i'll say but holy crap the kid actors absolutely incredible freaking nailed it and mm -hmm. i was so happy to see uh pam from true blood in this because i haven't seen her in anything since true blood and she did a freaking awesome job yeah she was awesome the kids were awesome Great film, 88 minute runtime. Mwah. This is exactly what a horror film should be. You get yeah. invested in the characters right away. It's, it's a fast moving film. You really don't know how things are going to end. You're hopeful, but you don't really know. It's definitely a must watch on Shudder. It's available sh on all the Shudder. So Shudder Amazon, regular Shudder, and then also Direct TV. Now, have you seen the next one, Scotty? Uh, I have not. This is one that I've been wanting to check out. All right. I will talk about it briefly then. This is also a Shutter watch. It is Candisha. Um, it is an 85 minute runtime. It is very similar to the story of Candyman. So I think all cultures have a have a similar story. Queen of Spades kind of did the same thing too. Uh, the idea of a ghost that if you engage in a certain ritual, you can call that ghost and it will stalk you. So this movie was, I found, very, very enjoyable. Yes, it's a familiar plot line. So if you feel like this is ripping off Candyman, that's fine. But Candyman isn't the only place where this folklore exists. This folklore right. is fairly common. The female actors, actresses in this do a great job. Um, all the characters are likable. You're invested in everyone. There's some awesome gory kill scenes in it. It's available on Shutter. It's worth the watch. Scotty, when you get a chance, I think you definitely need to watch this for our awards. Okay. I have this one. I think this was going to be one that I was going to try to watch either tonight or tomorrow. You will definitely dig it. I think there could be a best kill award. Ooh, nice. In this one. Yeah, I think there's a good contender for this one. So we're looking for this bad boy on Shutter, as I said. So Amazon regular Shutter, but it's also on AMC Plus. So I guess it's available to rent on AMC Plus. <laughs> Um, who let the dogs out? Scotty did. Scotty did. Scotty's sitting some pit bulls right now. So they're keeping him on his toes. <laughs> well, while he's trying to get those pit bulls, I'll skip to one other one that I know he hasn't had a chance to watch yet. And he's going to be back on with us shortly. So another movie that I watched that was a 2021 watch was Meander. So Meander is available on Netflix. 
It's more of a science fiction movie. I believe it's a French film. It's a 91 minute runtime. And basically it follows the same concept as Cube. Um, a woman is, wakes up and she is stuck in tubes and she has to climb through. And I'm not giving anything away there. You can see from the, from the title or from the poster what happens. And it's actually a really, really interesting film. Now, I had it up on Netflix here in Canada. It's saying that it's available on iTunes, Google Play, Voodoo, YouTube um, in Canada. And then, I don't know, some other channel that I've never heard of before. So I really enjoyed it, though it is more science fiction-y. Did you see Meander? No, this is one I was going to ask you about. I think you'll like it, Scott. It's really interesting. It's very science fiction-y, very much like Cube. I dug it a lot. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And I think you will get behind the main character. The main protagonist is actually very good. So Meander is available, as I said, on iTunes, Google Play. I could have swore I watched it on Netflix or Prime or some kind of free service or or something like that. Uh, if yeah, you play, I, sorry, go ahead. I think I know where you watched. I think it was a good friends plex. No, but I know, but I saw it somewhere else too. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, so I did see it on a good friends plex, but I thought I saw it somewhere else, but maybe it is just available for rent. $3.99, $5.99. I think if you enjoyed Cube, you'll like this movie. Definitely watch it. Definitely check it out. So I just nice. jumped forward because you were busy dealing with the pities. Um, so we'll go back to Knife Core because that's the one you watched. All right, so yep, Knife Core is a horror comedy uh, about a high school senior Wally Banks who sells knives door to door and gets trapped in a psychotic man's house, and he must escape before it's too late. Uh, and this stars uh, Kane Hodder as oh, the man nice. of the house, and this movie is is it Daniel think, Harris in this too? No. Oh, that's another one I saw with Kane Harder and Daniel Harris, a preview that I saw. Okay. But yeah, this one, I, I think it's pretty fun. Uh, it's not like going to be high up, like super high on my list, but mm. I found all the characters endearing and the whole door-to-door knife salesman thing is just kind of funny, like a silly thing, especially when there's a killer. It just makes the whole plot come together. And Kane Hodder does a great job of just being like over the top and also extremely intimidating when he need, when he wants to be. Um, I found this like it's definitely one that I would recommend to you. I think mm. it's like the type of comedy you would get a kick out of. Yeah. And okay. uh, I'd probably recommend it to Brandon too. Like I think you both would enjoy it. Now uh, it's a lower budget film, right? Yes. Would you say it's a contender for our lower budget awards? Possibly. Yes. Okay, cool. I like the concept because, you know, there used to be that door to door knife sales, which I haven't seen any door to door sales anymore because of COVID. Do yeah, you guys still have COVID those out is, by you? No, I think COVID has pretty much destroyed that for now. Thank fucking God. I used to hate yeah. fucking door-to-door salespeople. And I get it. They're just doing their job, but oh, so annoying. So yeah. I probably would deal, <laughs> dig this movie quite a bit. You're right. Yeah, I think you would have fun with this one. It's very, uh, very silly, tongue-in-cheek. And yeah, just all, like I said, all the, all the actors did a great job with their roles too. It's just very entertaining. That's awesome. So I, I guess I'll jump into my first theater watch of this year. Yeah, first oh, theater watch of this year. Such a I know. noob. Such a I, noob. Well, yeah, I didn't have a fucking choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, escape Room, Terminant of Champions. Now, uh, I, I don't know how many people have been listening to me, but one of my first podcasts I did was a top uh, nine, top list of 2019 films, and Escape Room came out in January 2019, and it was one of my favorite movies. Still is. I love Escape Room. I think it's a great fucking film. Oh, it's so much fun. It is. It's a lot of fun. So, of course, when I heard, I you know, you assume at the end of Escape Room 1, they're doing Escape Room 2. They kind of set it up for a sequel. Oh, yeah. So, walking into this, I knew it was going to be a sequel. It's not bad. Uh, I think that if you, if you were lukewarm on the first Escape Room, I don't think you're going to enjoy this one. Um... I think the escape rooms are definitely more elaborate and interesting, but some of the characters kind of stay out there welcome, specifically Ben. Uh, Ben makes some jokes in this movie where I was like, really? Oh. Really? Like, it was kind of like, you know how he was really funny in the first one? Yeah, I was like, just going to ask if this is the same Ben that I was But thinking it's of. over the top. Oh, okay. Like, it's just like every five seconds. And I just kind of was like, eh. But the rooms are really cool. There's some interesting new characters that we're introduced to. We get a better understanding of the corporation that runs the escape room. I think Zoe or the young lady that plays her, Taylor Russell, is a great actress. I think Logan Miller does a good job, too. I think everyone does a good job in this film for what it is. 
Um, and the special effects are great. Definitely a good theater watch, but you will have to have liked Escape Room 1 to really enjoy this sequel, in my opinion. If you did, it's definitely worth going to the theaters. If not, you could definitely rent it when it comes out. And I would say a $3.99 rental is fair if you weren't super hot on Escape Room. Or just wait till it drops on Netflix. And don't worry about watching it this year and watch it next year. Because if you weren't super hot on the first one, you're probably not going to be super hot on this, on the next one. So that's my thought. That's, that is fair. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to, I was wanting to see this in theater, but I think I missed my chance. So I'm, I'll just wait for a release somewhere streaming and check it out. Cause I did, you know me, I did love the first movie. So I look forward to seeing what this one's like. I think you'll enjoy it. Honestly, like I think when Liz comes out, if you guys have access to it, I would say the two of you should watch it. It's fun. All right. Like it's an easy to watch. It's a 88 minute runtime. It's short. It doesn't overstay. It's welcome. It gets to the point. Um, is it the best movie of the year? No. Is it entertaining? Yeah. Nice. Even even your roommate would like it. Yeah, I was going to say, this. that definitely sounds like something right up Tim's alley. Yeah, he would enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, speaking of, uh, you said it a couple times. Super, super hot. hot. I know I did that purposely. <laughs> uh, you've seen this one as well, right? I have, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this one, uh, Super Hot, is a, about a pizza delivery girl who discovers her neighbor is moving into a sorority house of vampires. Um. And that's pretty much all you need to know. This is another really low budget uh, comedy. Uh, this one was recommended to us by good old Brandon. Mm -hmm. And this, he he nailed it on the head when he described it as uh, uh, the main woman in this reminds me of Napoleon Dynamite. And mm -hmm. holy crap, she reminds me a lot of Napoleon Dynamite. Just very dry wit, dry sense of humor very monotone the whole way through it but once again another movie that has a lot of charm and heart to it you know what this movie was so low budget it hurt um but it didn't hurt the film yeah i feel like they had no money but they managed to get people that had enough acting chops to pull this shit off oh absolutely like i don't know who these people are but i can guarantee you some of them we're going to see again in later films yeah, I, I can definitely like, see like the first, the two main, like two of the main characters for sure. Even the sorority girls weren't bad for the yeah. roles they played. And I think that, I think Brandon and you are 100% right. If you dig Napoleon Dynamite, then you will like this film. If, Which is kind of funny because I was not a fan of Napoleon But Dynamite, you haven't but seen I, it for a long time. I bet the, if you watched it now, you would have a different opinion. On that it. is true. Right? Um, that Because that is a movie that kind of grows on you, for lack of a better word. Um so it would be really interesting to see you watch it now, but I think your your opinion of it was right on. It's available for rent on Prime. Um, also, if you have Prime, you can just watch it for free. And I say it's worth a three ninety nine rental or two ninety nine rental if you don't have it. But if it's for free and you liked Napoleon Dynamite or you really like some Sorry I Killed You that came out earlier this yeah. year, um, other movies like that, this is entertaining. Absolutely like it's funny. agree. Yeah, it's funny and it's clever and it's really well written. And it also reminds me of It Cuts Deep. Um, yeah, actually, right, which came out last year. That's now available on Shutter. So it'll be interesting if Shutter ever picks this up one day. Um, I guess it can't once it's been on Prime, but I don't know. Maybe it can. I don't know how distribution works, but right. yeah, yeah. I'll say I'm glad that like I'm glad that he recommended this one to both of us because yeah, this is definitely a high high one on my list. I really really dug the hell out of this. And I once again, 100%. you said year of the indie films and horror comedies, and holy crap! Yeah, I will say that to him blue in the face. This is the year of indie films. If you are not watching indie films, you are missing out. Yeah. Um, I say that with a lot of authority and I mean it with a lot of authority. There is very good indie films out there and there's some great horror comedies. And I, I fear if horror comedy isn't your thing and you don't like horror and comedy, that's fine. Like no disrespect, but there is some really great movies because out of the theatrical what the movies I've watched, none of them have really like hit home for me. I think the only one that's even in my top 10, well, technically Slack that came out in theaters last year and Spiral. Yeah, I would say Spiral is the only one that's in my top list right now. Like the rest of them, I don't like. And the, and yet again, it's not to shit on movies like Saint Maud. I understand no. a lot of people like Saint Maud. It just wasn't my jam. Um, and, or Unholy, which was just not a lot of people like that one. It was fucking. Yeah, I, I missed that one. So <laughs> yeah. I'm great. I, there's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, you recommend the rental for Super Hot too, Scotty? Oh, absolutely. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I guess we'll move to the next one, which is. 
Howard's Mill. So uh, our good friend, Brandon Orlick from Exploding Heads, who apparently we're both in love with because he's come up like so many times on this show. We said his name five times yet. Is he going to appear and tell us that he's tired? Brandon Orlick. Oh, he just appeared to be napping. He just appeared and he's napping. He's like, why the fuck are you two talking? Um, (laughs) So Howard's Mill is a found footage film and it basically takes place that there's this mill that area that people keep disappearing at. It's It's a faux documentary. Brandon liked it a lot more than I did. I would not say it's bad. I would say it's very good. People have put it on the same level as Lake Mongo. Um, I have a pretty high bar for Lake Mongo. I think it's pretty hard to come close to Lake Mongo. But did I think this was an excellent film? Absolutely, I did. It's a free watch on Tubi, so you can't go wrong. Uh, You just have to sit through some commercials. If you like found footage, this is definitely a film that you may enjoy. Um, and you can decide for yourself if it's as good as Link Mongo. But if you don't like, you know, mock do- mockumentaries and you don't like Lake Mongo, then don't watch this film, even if it's free on Tubi. But if you like those kind of things, then I definitely recommend it as a Tubi watch. Nice. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, will have to check this one out because I completely forgot this one uh, had been brought up by you two. And like, I forgot that you weren't nearly as high on it as him. So I'm kind of curious to see where I'd land on it. Yeah, it's a good film, though. I, just because he liked it more, I wouldn't say it's a bad movie. Um, it's an entertaining film. It's just you really, I don't know, it just connected with him more. So right. the next one is Behind the Sightings, which is about, do you remember when there was everyone dressing up like a clown mm-hmm. several years ago? So it basically kind of builds on that and all these people dress up like clowns. And it has a couple that takes it too far. And it's kind of like Blair Witch Project meets Grave Encounters found footage wise also a to be watch it's not bad um it's entertaining it's interesting i i i was really into a little bit of a found footage thing i think this is just before you went away i started like binging on found footage for some reason um but yeah it was it was it was not bad so oh i'm sorry it's not a to be watch it's available on itunes google play um voodoo and youtube so i would say a 2.99 rental at the most but you got to dig found footage. You got to like things like the Blair Witch Project mixed with Grave Encounters, mixed with uh, the house that October built, but maybe not the first one, like the second one. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So, and the next one, I think you've seen. Yes, I have. Uh, So this is a uh, Netflix exclusive called a classic horror story. And it's pretty much a, it is an Italian horror film. A uh, bunch of people go in an RV and they are just going on a road trip and then something happens and they are pretty much in the middle of nowhere and basically being hunted. Mm-hmm. There is more to it than that, but I'm not going to give it away here. You need to watch it to see what I mean. But I uh, would say if you are a fan of Suspiria and what was the other one? Um, Midsommar. Midsommar then I would say give this a watch because you could def ah, it wears its influences on its sleeves and it's not shy about it. No, it's like we're inspired by these movies. Did you not know that? Because we are. I forgot to give the runtime for the other two um, found footage. The runtimes for those are an hour and a half each. This one is 95 minutes. So we're also looking at just over an hour and a half. I agree with Scott's assessment of it. I think this movie is going to be very popular in the horror community. Uh, I think it's okay. Like, don't get me wrong. I think it's it's some great gore. I think there's some good kills in it. I think the characters you do get behind, there's one in particular that you do get behind. Um, But I did find for me, I I would probably put it in in an average rating. You know, I I think maybe a good six and a half to seven out of 10. Okay. See, I'm more of an eight because I really, I really did like it. The ending just made it not Top oh, see, that's funny because I really like the ending. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So that tells you right there. Two very different opinions. I thought that it was something different. I kind of feel the same way about the slasher flick that came out from Poland last year. Even though they used a mm. lot of inspirations at the camps and stuff, I thought it was still really entertaining. And I still yeah. think this one's really entertaining too. Um, it's obviously using a lot of inspirations and just being less shy about it. Uh, but yeah, it's worth it for a free watch on Netflix. I don't think you can really go wrong. Right, exactly. I say it's very well filmed. It's definitely got money behind it. And yeah, yep. it's definitely been heavily inspired. So if you're a fan of any type of Italian cinema, give this a watch. I agree 100%. All right, next one. Have you seen this one? Nope. Another Netflix film, Blood Red Sky. 
Uh, this film is actually getting a lot of likes from people that we know in the community. And this is a long one, 121 minutes long. This is why I have not watched it yet. Cause I was like, yeah, it's, oh, it's a hours. long runtime. Yeah, it is a long runtime. Uh, basically it's about a hijacking on a plane and there is something on the plane that the hijackers are not aware of. And it's supernatural. So it's, you would probably like it. Uh, it is interesting. Maybe this is another one for when Liz comes to visit, you guys could watch this together fast paced, very emotional. Uh, you can watch it with subtitles. I believe it's in German, uh, is its original language, or you can watch it, you know, dubbed if that's what you prefer. Well-made, well-made film, very interesting film, very good take on the supernatural element, supernatural element, awesome effects, uh, really good effects, actually. A lot of money was put into this film. And for a free watch on Netflix, I don't think you can go wrong. So I would say to anyone, if you enjoy a mix between action and horror, you're going to be very pleased with this film. Nice. Yeah, I, I am looking forward to checking this one out. Just haven't had the time yet. This one's fun. Like that other one about the zombies that came out earlier this year in Las Vegas. Oh, okay. But this one takes itself more seriously. But so oh, Snack Cider was the director. Um, oh, uh, I can't remember yeah. what it was now. Sea Nation? Oh, oh Army Nation. of the Dead. Army of the Dead. Um, I thought that was a lot of fun. And I think this one's a lot of fun. But Blood Red Sky definitely takes itself more seriously. But I would say the same level of money of what you're getting for a Netflix film. Like it's a high quality, well-made Netflix film. Nice. And yeah, then there's one. Aftermath, which we'll get into <laughs> shortly. <laughs> I don't think you've had the pleasure, have you, Scotty? Nope. Um, I was warned not to watch this movie, but I put it on for some brain candy. And let me tell you, I have never seen Sean Aston Moore take off his shirt for more no reason more than in this film. Um, every time he went to make out with his wife, he took off his shirt every nice. single time. Um, My man. <laughs> he was just, and don't get me wrong, Sean Aston Moore is a good looking man. You know, he looks great, but it was just ridiculous how often he took off his shirt. This movie is a whopping 114 minutes long. <laughs> Unlike the other film that I got why it was 121 minutes long, I did not get why they made this 114 minutes. They could have made this 65 minutes and it probably would have been oh, just wow. as effective. <laughs> But, 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 but this is what saved this movie. And I see people have given it two and a half stars. It's because Ashley Green and Sean and Aston Moore have the funniest fucking dialogue I think I've ever seen between a married couple. Like this movie had no business as being entertaining as it was. And I give all the credit to those two actors. They were, they delivered these lines as a married couple. Like they would burn each other and it was funny how they would react. Like this was a Lifetime movie with two actors that were better than Lifetime movies. Nice. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like they knew it was a Lifetime movie and they were like, this is fucking dumb. But hey, we're getting a fucking paycheck. Let's run with it, right? Like honestly- if you watch it for any other reason than for their, you know, ridiculous acting, like perhaps let's say you were doing something else like cleaning, um, eating, making out, this would be a great movie to have. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> because you can go in and out of this movie and not really fucking miss anything. Like it's a paint by number fucking film. But I will, I will definitely give the credit to Sean Ash Ashmore and Ashley Green because they carry this shitty film. If it wasn't for the two of them, I really wouldn't say to you, watch it while you're making out. But <laughs> it's easy, it's digestible, but not a lot of money put into this one. Like this one looks like it was filmed with a shoe shoestring budget oh um, boy. and a lifetime you feel, but because of these two, it doesn't feel like that bad of a lifetime movie. Honestly, huh. like, honestly, I don't, I don't know how these two agreed to do this film. And I think they must actually like each other as people because they were having a fucking blast in this movie. Like it was really, really well done. And there's a really sweet puppy in it. That's a oh. very well-trained dog uh, that does some pretty good dog tricks. Um, nice. But yeah, not the opposite of the funding that went into Blood Red Sky. Like, yeah, not even, I was like, is this a Hallmark movie, but not as bad? Like, that's really what it felt like. So anyway, that's Aftermath on Netflix. So if this sounds like something that would be good for you, I don't know. You're looking at making out during a movie and you don't really want to watch the movie. But when you tune into it, you want to be entertained enough. Aftermath's your film. So <laughs> check it out for free on Netflix. 
And then the last one is horror in the high desert. I almost thought I said in high desert. Can you imagine? High horror, desert. Higher mm. desert. Mm, it's like high chow, like top, like uh, stocked tea, cheesecakes on top of each other or a chocolate fountain. And then, or like, like the gold, plate, gold dust on your ice cream. Right? Oh man, that sounds fucking delicious. So I guess I'll talk about this one because I don't think you saw it. Nope. Yeah, uh, see? Never even heard of this one. Well, this one's also a found footage film that Brandon Orlick recommended to me. See, there we go saying his name again. Now we're just cursed for life. Oh, we're God, he's going to gonna, like... uh, show up on the show and it's just going to, oh, God. Oh, God. I know, right? You know what's actually going to happen? He's going to show up and then tell us that there's too many pumpkins in Halloween Kills. Actually, that's a spoiler, Dave. There's too many pumpkins in Halloween Kills. <laughs> they took the pumpkin And gizmos in it, apparently. And they fucking doubled it. So, and, <laughs> can and, you imagine? And gizmos in it. <laughs> and Halloween kills is just lines of pumpkins <laughs> down the street. <laughs> That'd be really funny. Anyway, back to horror in the high desert. Uh, this is an 80 minute runtime, which is a perfect runtime for this found footage film. This found footage film has made it up my list to where do I have it? Number 31 out of 137. Oh, it is a very, very good found footage film. It is about a young man who goes missing in um north uh, nevada and it follows his journey to how he went missing it's a mockumentary as well if someone said to me this is up there with lake mongo i'd be absolutely it is i would actually put the last scene as scarier than lake mongo there is oh, wow. an ending scene of this that is very scary and this is an example of how when you don't have a lot of money and you do found footage you can do something really well and just be creepy without special effects nice so if this sounds like something that is up your alley, it is a free watch on Tubi. Um, it is also available for rent. I would say watch it on Tubi. If for some reason you're averse to commercials, you can rent it on YouTube. I think $3.99, $5.99. If you like found footage and if you enjoy uh, stuff like Lake Mongo, this is very good. Movie is horror in the high desert, not dessert. That's going to be the movie that Scott and I are going to refer to it as. Like, what did we say? Eden Lake? Yeah. Like Eden? What Lake, we call Eden. Lake, yeah. Eden. Lake Eden. <laughs> Lake Eden, the new film, Lake Eden. It's like the target version of <laughs> of Lake of Eden Lake. So that covers our 2021 releases. Uh, we'll be back more in a couple of weeks with more 2021 movies. So a little bit less, I think, this time. This was just after four weeks of not seeing each other and podcasting, so we had a lot to talk about. Yep. But I think mostly hits more than misses. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. Something for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, we we all we cover a lot of the subgenres in this. That's why I love. We do. We we just love us. Let's be real. <laughs> I love me. I I'm, just I, I just missed us, Scott. <laughs> I I missed us so much. <laughs> you know we're nicer. I'm nicer to you right now because I missed you so much. You I know. That? I was gonna say like you haven't like picked on me, and I'm kind no. of scared. No, you know why? Because Gary thinks I'm a big bully. <laughs> I, uh, we did a show with Gary Hill for It's Not Horror, okay? And Gary was like, Heather crushes Scott. So I won't go into detail because anyway, he basically indicated that I demasculate Scott, um, which I guess I probably do, but that's toxic masculinity talking. I just tease Scott. He knows that I think he's the bomb diggity. Um, exactly. <laughs> right? And if anyone hurt Scott, I'd fucking cut their throat out. Um, yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not really. So <laughs> um, older films. I have one here, but did you have one you want to talk about? Nope. I looked on my list and nope, I haven't watched any older films yet in a long time, apparently. Wow. You're just too busy playing. You know why? You're playing video games all the time too now. Yeah. I get, like I said, got back into a video game. So it's been uh, sucking a lot of my life away again. That's say That's okay. Well, did you see this found footage film I'm going to be referring to? Um. Uh, Yes, I don't remember much. All I remember is it where it takes place. Okay, so the movie I'm referring to is As Above, As Below. It's a 2014 found footage film. Uh, basically, this woman is looking for her father who went disappearing, who disappeared out of the catacombs of Paris. And uh, basically, you go in there and you get disoriented and it's a it's a found footage film and it actually has a different ending than what I was prepared for. I'll be honest. I was kind of shocked at the ending, but it's a very well done movie. It's a 93 minute runtime. 2014 is when it came out. I, I didn't even know about this. It's only because a good friend has uploaded all his own found footage films to Plex, which is the only reason why I saw it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cause uh, 
this one I remember really enjoying finding it creepy and just the whole setting of the catacombs in Paris is such a great setting for horror and also one of the one of my uh what do you call that a uh, bucket list travel places I want to go to oh yeah yeah I would love to go to Paris and go to the catacombs oh what if this happened while you were down there well it'd be a great touristy experience to bring home and tell everybody about <laughs> <laughs> well I went down to Paris and you know what happened a ghost came and got me um, I got spooked like crazy you wouldn't believe it <laughs> Well, it's better than you talking about your cannibal experience out in uh, the UP, huh? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went up there with people. And, you know, you didn't do any, speaking of the UP, you didn't do a found footage film like we thought you were going to do this year. No, I didn't go exploring any abandoned cabins or mines like I really wanted to. But you know what? Those buildings and mines will always be around. There will be time for me to explore those. Well, the found footage would have been you fucking drinking and smoking and listening to music. <laughs> right. And they'd be like, wow, this is really boring. Yeah, you swim and you go in the sauna. That's your found footage film. That'd be great. We should do a found footage film when you come. I'm so like, I'm so bad. There's a target near me. We should walk around it. Like it's a, now a different kind of store. And we should be like, here we are checking out the ghost of the forgiven target and like shake hangers and shit. Oh my God, it'd be great. Oh, oh, do you feel that cool spot? It's here. It's here. <laughs> Ghost, if you can hear me, give me a sign. <laughs> oh, oh, he shook one of the cereal boxes. I know it. I know it. They're here. They're here. Anyway, as above, as below. Excellent found footage film. Very well acted. It has a 3.1 rating on Letterbox. Everyone who's watched it has given it four stars, three and a half stars. So obviously it's popular. It's available for rent on Amazon, iTunes, Google, uh, YouTube and Cineplex. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, please do. It's worth your time. Hell yeah. All right. What we've been listening to. Scotty, you go ahead. Since you had no uh, film to share, why don't you talk about your what you've been listening to first? All right. So I, uh, just like the last episode that we recorded, I'm still on an audiobook kick. And, uh, well, just like Brandon, this person's getting brought up a lot today, too. Uh, Liz and I have talked and uh, she actually started reading Stephen King's books in chronological order. And I was like, you know what? I have every Stephen King novel on audiobook format. I'm going to follow along with you because there's a lot of these books I've never actually read. Uh -huh. And then we can be dorky and have a book club afterwards to talk about the, talk uh -huh. about the differences. That's why I, I ended up... <laughs> <laughs> And, I'll just talk uh, to Liz about that. Yeah, you do that. Let's call her right now <laughs> <All right>. and <laughs> ask her. <laughs> but yep, uh, so I ended up uh, reading for the first time, or I guess listening to for mm -hmm. the first time, Stephen King's Carrie, which oh, is nice. his very first novel. And definitely uh, some uh, differences from the movie, obviously. Mm. Um, I like the way this book is structured because it actually uh, like tells the story, takes mm. breaks, and then has like scientific uh, research papers that it's reading through about telekinesis. And then it goes to like interviews with people that survived what happened at the prom and hearing their side of the story and then going back to the story. And it just kind of goes back and forth like that. And the way it's put together, it's very, uh, very fascinating. I almost kind of want to like see like a mockumentary version like of carry like after the events and the people that are still alive and just that's cool like a, that'd be like i could kind of picture it being like that that'd be really neat that would be um, really that's a cool idea scott yeah i think that'd just be kind of fun um but yeah i really dug the hell out of it uh this audiobook was actually narrated by sissy spacek oh was, cool yeah which was really awesome and she did an amazing job um super short read i think it was like six and a half seven hours for an audiobook that's so it's like i think 300 pages 400 pages max in a book um, but yeah, I really dug the hell out of this audiobook, and I have started the next one, which I will talk about on the next episode. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you have someone like a friend to share this information with. I like friends. I have lots of friends. <laughs> Maybe Liz friend. and I can be a friend and we can, we can read Stephen King books together too, though he does have this. Have you guys read Funland or listened to the, uh, the audiobook for that? It was never made into a movie, but I kind of want you guys no. to read it. And listen to it because I think it would be an awesome movie. It's one of his yeah. more recent novels. Okay, because yeah, it's uh, because yeah, we're what our plan is just to kind of go chronologically through every one of his books. Wow, that sounds like a big commitment. 
Yeah, and like I say, I already have a shit ton of his audiobooks just from back when I worked third shift, and I just never listened to him because I had to use up credits, so I said, screw it, I'm buying all Stephen King's books just to have them on my collection. So it gives oh. me an excuse to finally listen to them all. Oh, I was wrong. Joyland, not Funland, Joyland is the uh, is Stephen King book that I'm thinking of that I want you guys to read. Okay. Um, as your friendship grows, maybe that's something you can read up to because this book is 2013, so you guys got a way to go. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say I'm, well, I'm hoping we get to uh, Under the Dome, which I think is like 2015, 2016. Which one's, when was Cujo written? Um, That's got to be mid 80s, I would think. It'd be interesting. I really look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts on Cujo. Maybe we should have her on the show when you guys do that. It'd be interesting if we just did an audio book review or we actually did a book review sometime. We had her on, like she reads Cujo you listen, I listen or read it. And then we talk about how it was different from the movie yeah. and how they could, because we know I don't like the movie, right? But I, I'd be interested to hear what other people's perspective on it is it is on it and also the books. I think it's going to give you a much better understanding of Stephen King films. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because I know uh, coming up soon will be uh, The Stand, The Shining. Mm. And uh, I've read The Stand before. And yeah, that's an epic freaking book. Um, then yeah, Stephen King's it and yeah, all like all the big ones are gonna be coming up in like the early eighties. I'm the one I'm looking forward to though is reading the book of Christine, just because yeah. you know how you know how much that movie I know it's me. well it means a lot to you. Yeah, it's yeah, a very so, uh, emotional movie for you. Yeah. Um good movie though. Fucking oh, absolutely. Movie. And I wonder how close it is to the book. Yeah, it will be it will be really interesting to hear your perspectives. Well, you know what? Even what we're what we're listening to, you should probably do a quick comparison, just like you did with the Carrie. Like I think that would be really cool if you've seen the Stephen King films. Cause I think you've seen almost all Stephen King films, haven't you? Yeah, majority of them. Right. So it would be cool to hear you just give a little synopsis of like what you thought was good that was different or what you thought was, you know, what they could have included and stuff. Cause it's hard to include a book in, obviously into a film, but right. There's a lot to cover. And I like I think especially with Carrie, how that played out like in the book. I think yeah. back then it was gonna it would have been hard for them to structure it and keep keep people's attention but like i think now it could be done in like a faux documentary style yeah yeah that's cool i'm glad you're doing that that's awesome um to do that with a friend like yeah, this gives me a lot of uh gives me a lot of fun things to do and gets me uh caught up on my king knowledge it also gets you to hang out with liz which is exactly. also cool because oh, i would like to hang out with liz but i live in canada <laughs> can't hang out with Liz. <laughs> you can't hang out with none of us Americans. I can't hang out with any Americans unless it's virtual. Well, that's not true. I could fly in. I could fly to Chicago and see Liz. I'll meet you there. Uh, um, deal. Right? <laughs> deal. So the I've been listening to Medical Mysteries. So Ooh. yeah, this is actually really interesting. Even though it's by the podcast network, it's a little more serious. And honestly, so so the first episode I listened to, it talked about this random disease that happened around the same time that polio did and people would just become like zombie state so they would be normally functioning and they would get overly tired they would want to sleep all the time and then eventually they just came to the point where they were comatose and they could barely do anything on their own accord so then they started kind of taking in different like certain doctors started to experiment with different medicines and they found out that there was a protein that was missing and they started adding this protein back into people and some of them recovered, but some of them recovered to the point and then they would remember they were comatose for the past two years and they wanted to go back to being comatose because it was too hard to have emotions again. Oh, wow. Like it's super fascinating. Um, so that's just one of the examples. There's also, let's see here. Um, there was another one that was really, really good. Medical mysteries. Oh, I can't see it. Um, One's about like the dancing curse and stuff like that, that occurred in the, the, the dancing plague. Oh yeah. I heard yeah, about where that. People couldn't stop dancing. So it was, it's a really cute, not really cute. I would say it's actually a really educational podcast and you really do learn about these medical things that have occurred over time and how they've tried to kind of establish why these things have occurred. It's short episodes. The episodes are about 45 minutes in length. So you're not looking at a long time. 
like, let's see here. Um, so this is one. So in the 18th century England, Mary Toff defied all medical odds when she started giving birth to rabbits. What the? Right? Like, that's <laughs> fucking crazy. But it happened. It's historically, like, it's a historically well-researched podcast. So definitely something if you're interested in. It's only offered on Spotify now. So you just go into the search bar. I'm going to sound like podcast when they advertise. But you just enter in medical mysteries. And it's totally worth it. If you're interested in science and and medicine and, and how we've got to the point where we are today and why vaccines are so important, cough, cough, um, <laughs> then you can, you can learn that through medical mysteries. It's actually a really, really good podcast. Not as interesting nice. as what you talked about, but I really enjoyed it. Actually, I find that quite fascinating. Nick. Oh yeah. That'd be, yeah. It'd be something I would like to listen to for sure. You think Liz would like to listen to it? Actually, I think she probably would because she is into a lot of well, medical shows. Nurse, and stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're talking about Liz a lot. So maybe that's something Liz and I could do together. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about that, Scott? Maybe Liz will be my new go best for friend. It. Go for it. I'll see if I care. <laughs> <laughs> fine, I'll take all my friends. I don't give a shit. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fighting over Liz. No one wants Brandon, though. We're both like, nah, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, you can have him. You can have him. We're like tossing him back and forth like a hot potato. He doesn't um, know what's going on. He's napping the whole time. He just gets he tossed he would back be and forth. napping the entire time. And that fluffy, fluffy hair of his would keep him cushioned as he <laughs> fell. So... Uh, we will be back. We will take a brief break and hear from our one, one of our many, many Legion podcast friends. So if you are not subscribing to the Legion Network, please head on over to the website and hit subscribe on any of your podcast listening tool of choice. We appreciate the support. Um, and after these messages, we'll be right back. Cha-cha. Hello? Hello, who is this? Who are you trying to reach? I don't know. Oh, I think you've got the wrong number. Do I? I'm gonna hang up. Wait, don't hang up. What's that noise? Popcorn? You're making popcorn. Uh huh. I only eat popcorn when I listen to podcasts. I'm about to listen to a podcast. Oh, really? Which one? Probably the podcast on Haunted Hill. Is that the one with the two guys with the beards? Uh, yeah, Dan and Gav. Most episodes, they look at two different horror movies. Each episode, they look at a world of the strange, where they look at weird things from around the world. Sometimes, they even do special episodes where they look at different genres or directors' discographies and talk about them. Do you have a boyfriend? Maybe. So where can I find the podcast on Haunted Hill? Well, you can go to legionpodcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, or just go into iTunes and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. So, are you going to ask me out? And welcome back. So this week we are talking about children's horror stories. And we're not talking about your children and what horror stories they cause for you. We're actually talking about children horror stories. So the first film that we're going to be talking about is Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. But we would not have Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark if we did not have the book series. Now, Scott, did you ever own any of the scary stories to tell in the bar- dark bark? bark. <laughs> scary it's, st- the do- it's the dog bark. version. <laughs> it's the dog version. Scary stories to bark. Uh, <laughs> scary stories to tell in the dark. Did you ever have any of the books? Oh, yeah. I uh, I remember, like, I had them when I was in elementary school, and I remember always reading them whenever the bus picked me up, so riding the school bus to school and back. Nice. That's where I would always read them. And Do you have a yeah. favorite? Um, one of my favorites is uh, the spider bite. I forget what the actual story name is called, but, like, the spider bite where she's taking a shower and the spider comes out of her face. Uh, right. And then also uh, the, I think it was called The Viper. And it was about like, it was just like the scary story, but it ends up being just this window wiper. And he's like, I've come to vipe your windows or something like that. Yes. Yes. The Viper. It was in the first one that was released in 1981. Yep. I re- like those are the two I remember like very clearly. The other ones I would have to kind of get refreshers on what they were. Well, I agree. I remember uh, now, mind you, 1981, you and I, well, I wasn't even born yet. You were just Just a baby. (laughs) So Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is a series of three collections of short stories for children, uh, short horror stories for children, uh, written by Alvin Schwartz and originally illustrated by Stephen Gamley. In 2011, HarperCollins published editions featuring new art, 
um, stirring some controversy among fans. So sequencing print printings have restored the original art and the title of the books are Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, 1981. More Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark 1984, and Scary Stories 3, More Tales to Chill Your Bones. Three, these three books each feature a number of short stories in the horror genre. Uh, they were definitely derived from folklore and urban legends as topics of his stories and researched extensively, spending more than a year on writing each book, which is probably why the books were so good and the stories yeah. were so creepy, right? Um, acknowledged influences include Shakespeare, T.S. Eliot, Mark Twain, Joe Chandel Harris, Bennett Cherf, Cherf, Surf, 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 and uh, Jan Harold Brunner. Thank you. The first volume was published in 1981, and the books have subsist have subsequently sub subsequently uh, thank you been collected <laughs> in both a box set and a single volume. I can remember when I used to go to uh, something called the Scholastic book fair here yes did you have that too yep and you know you would like take your if you had money you know you would take your money to the book fair and you would see these books and I remember the like, the artwork would always pull me in mm -hmm. even though I was kind of a scared kid I did read these books and I did find the stories like you just kept reading and reading and reading uh, there's an audio version, by the way, of the books. So maybe I'm, one day you and Liz can do that. Listen to the <laughs> auto version of fucking scary stories to tell in the dark. Well, I will definitely be snagging those up because I do love audio books. And George S. Irving, that name sounds very familiar. So I will have to uh, look into those. Absolutely. And so as of 2017, the books have been collected. The books have collectively sold more than 7 million copies <sighs> and appeared on numerous children's bestsellers list. They have collectively been held as a cultural torchstone for a generation. Couldn't agree more. With yeah. the original charcoal and ink artwork often singled out for its praise. They have also been frequently subject to criticism from parents and social groups who consider them inappropriate for children. Um, yeah, they're scary. I, I yeah. don't think that that's a unfair statement, but know your kid. Yeah, you know? I was, yeah, that's kind of like my mom. She looked at those and goes, "Well, you know what's real, what's not real, and you and you and plus, you know, at that point, I was a huge horror movie nerd at the beginning of my life, so it just worked for me." Right, and I think that these stories are just stories. There's way scarier things that people hear about on the news or that happen in their life every day um, than the big toe. We all know that you're not actually going to find a big toe in a garden, eat it, and someone's going to come back for it. Like that's not actually a thing. So. Right. But it creates for a really, really great short story. Um, the first book had the most stories at 29 stories. The third book had 28 stories. And finally, the third and final book had 25. And that's a shame. I remember I remember these stories actually really well. I feel like we should read one one day on Friday Nightmares, do like a little Friday Nightmare short. And it's just us reading these stories. Um, oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, they're just, they're fun, fun, fun stories. Well, you know, now that we've talked about the books, we have to talk about the movie. So yes, we do. I'll let you bring us in with the movie. All right. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was released August 7th, 2019, directed by, I believe the name is Andre Overdahl, which is also directed Autopsy of Jane Doe. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yep. And uh, Troll Hunter. I believe was the other one he did. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Uh, so I was, for one, when I seen his name attached, I was, I was already excited just from seeing the name of this movie because I knew mm -hmm. what it was going to be. Seeing his name attached had me even more excited. But we'll get into that later. Uh, but the synopsis is when a trio of bullies chase Tommy and his friends, and the three end up hiding in Raymond's car. They then ask Raymond if he wishes to join them in exploring a haunted house nearby. Such a shitty explanation for what this awesome movie is. Uh, yeah. But just to give a background here, this movie was filmed in St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. It started filming on August 27th, 2018 and ended on November 1st, 2018. Oh, nice. So it ended the day after Halloween, which is interesting because this whole film is set around Halloween. Yeah. And I love the time period that they set this in too, which is very unique. 1968. Yeah. 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 I, what I really love about this film is, so when this film, when they announced, you know, we're going to do scary stories to tell in the dark and they did the teaser trailer, I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Like I was very excited, but I was like, how are they going to do this? There's a whole bunch. Are they going to do like an anthology 
and someone's reading from the book and showing the different stories and they kind of did do an anthology and this is how you would adapt a children's story or a book fucking amazingly i i have nothing but praise for this film i have a hard time finding a fault with this film and i don't care if that sounds biased it is entertaining it is well acted the stories that are told in it you get some of the big hit stories from the book yeah. Like, and I, I don't know, like I got nothing but praise for this movie and the way that it, it pulled the big toe story, the way that it had the pimple story, the scarecrow, uh, the pale woman, the pale woman, like, and the artwork and the, and the design of these, of the pale woman, like, yeah, like they wow. literally brought the artwork to life in this movie. And I did. That was one of the things I was worried about is, okay, they're doing this movie. They are doing a movie based off a book that has illustrations for the characters and the things that happen. How are they going to pull this off? Because these characters are cemented in our minds from Mm -hmm. from when we were kids. Are are they going to actually be able to pull this off? And holy shit, if they did not freaking pull this off. Like, Like, amazing. (laughs) Yeah, like the design of every one of these were just unnerving, like, unnervingly like spot on it's incredible how like they did this and yeah like you said like i when i seen the trailer i'm going okay this is going to be an anthology and like you said it kind of is but no it's a full story that just kind of brings these stories into it in such a unique way and they do it with such care which is amazing like you know i'm with you i don't find a flaw in this film even the filming of the film was it set up that whole artwork piece the film has this dark tinge to it yeah right it's like it's you're watching a ghost story the entire time and the it the fact that it's set in 1968 so you get that kind of old time feeling to it it's around the time at the vietnam war so there's the draft dodging stella is writing stories and you know they meet up like it's funny because when they run to that drive-in, they're watching. I think it's Night of the Living Dead, isn't yep. it? Because yeah, that came out in 1968. So yeah, that was big at the right? drive-in at that time. And just and when and when that Tommy kid goes back to his house and Harold gets revenge on him, like it's it's creepy and it's scary. And when Augie gets taken by the big toe monster, it is incredible. Like the whole setup, not just the characters represented the artwork from that film, the whole filming of the film did. Yeah. And the acting of these young people is fucking incredible. They're all likable. You don't want anything bad to happen to any of them, except for Tommy. He's a dick. But everyone else. Right. Yeah, like, they did an amazing job with this. Like, just, they, this is how, like you said, this is how you do a children's horror book. They even did it where, you know, you could bring uh, our generation, because, you know, our generation grew up on this film. Yeah. And they made it PG-13, so our generation could bring our children to go see this. Yeah. And they did it without it being like over the top gory. There might've been a few slang words used and maybe a few swear words, but mm-hmm. like all in all, like this felt like, you know, a teenager, young teen style horror film done well, where not only will kids like, like it if they're into these types of movies, but people like us who grew up on them are going to love the hell out of it as well. Like they just, they towed that line and they did it amazingly somehow. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm just looking up to see what the rating of it was. I think it was PG. Oh, PG, really? I'm looking to see if I can find it. Or maybe if it was what do you what are your ratings in the States? Is it AA, it's, which uh, is 14 plus? No, it's P uh, G, PG, PG 13, then R. So I think this was PG 13. Yeah. And I this is yet again for all those horror fans out there that shit on PG 13 horror movies is an example of a phenomenally well done, creepy PG-13 movie. When Augie gets taken under that fucking bed, you don't know that's going to happen. They build up that suspense without any blood or gore. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm, t- I'm getting really up on a soapbox here. So I apologize, Scott. But you know, on like <laughs> the conjuring, when, when like, it's like that, <laughs> like it's that jump scare all the time. Yeah. This is jump scares used fucking well. Yeah. Like, like that's what a good jump scare is. Yeah. Like they didn't rely on it to scare you. They built up to it. They, creeped you out ahead of time right 
and it's and it's not every five seconds yeah right it was in it was in not every scene either it happened with augie it happened kind of with harold's scene and even yeah, with the bit. me the toe one me what was that yeah, one? I, toe. I forget how it, me yeah i forget how what that one said i know people are listening to us going ah this but i can't remember it off the top of my head I think it was me toe. I gotta look it up now. Me toe, which that wasn't a jump scare. So he's in the jail cell and they're waiting for it to come. And you have the buildup of hearing that it's coming. The j- the jangle man. Yeah. Right. And not a jump scare. No. Right. And you get a jump scare at the end with Sarah's reaction. Yep. At the end, you I got I got startled by that in the theaters. But the best jump scare is fucking Augie's. That is exactly how a jump scare should be in a film. And I just can't get over praising this movie. I can't. Like yeah. even when they meet up in the drive-in and they're talking about you know what's happened, and it's just so well done, incredibly uh- well done. I couldn't agree more. And this uh, watching it for the show, this was my second time watching it. The last time I seen it was in theater. So Same it was nice me. to nice to revisit it. And I'm kind of sad I left it off my top 10 list because I think you had it on your top 10. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I ended up, I think it was just shy of my top 10, like number 12 or something like that. But rewatching, I'm going, yeah, this would have been in my top 10 for sure if I would have thought, thought about it more. Honestly, this is in my top 10 all-time favorite horror films. Really? That is how much I like this film. Wow. Um, the ending scene where they eventually get out of the jailhouse. So how they, and how they even entwine the stories so it carried the plot along. Yeah. Like the whole Jangle Man piece is basically this, you know, the kid Ramon has been a draft dodger and it's playing on their fears of what they're afraid of. They manage to get out of the jail cell. They go back to the house and her, you know, Stella has to confront Sarah. And that whole buildup of when she goes back in time and it connects back to the older woman that, uh, not Augie, the other young man saw earlier. And then she has that standoff with Sarah. It's amazing. Like that that dialogue that that young lady delivers where she's like, no, I'm going to tell you a story, right? And basically talks about how she's doing all these evil things. And it's because of, you know, she feels betrayed from her family. Like it's such a powerful movie. It really is. And I just, the way it's filmed, the way it's acted, the way they integrated these short stories, the way they kept the artwork from the first from the original stories. Like this movie's a 10 out of 10. I, I'm sure there's people out there that are like, oh, well, I didn't like, it. and that's cool. Like if it wasn't your jam, respect. I don't, not here to tell people what they like or don't like. But objectively looking at this film on a second time watch after not seeing it for two years, I, I can't wait for a sequel. I was Googling, when is the fucking sequel coming? Like I just cannot wait to see what they do next. I know, I would love to see a sequel and I would love to see what stories they integrate into this one. And yeah. Like, and they, like you said, you said it, they set it up perfectly for a sequel. Perfect. And, and the, and they, the, like, I can't get past job. the acting. I can't get past the acting of it either with these young kids and the yeah. delivery of the lines. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, this is going to become a uh, Halloween rotation for me now for like around the Halloween season, for sure. Cause it has that Halloween feel to it and everything. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's really hard to, uh, we were just talking about Stephen King. It's really funny that we, you know, you did that, that you brought that Carrie audio book in and we talked about the comparison and had a little Stephen King chat there for a couple minutes, because this is an example of where you take an anthology set of stories and you make it into a movie and bring it truly to life. Like you, you really, these, everybody who worked on this film brought it to life and they did a phenomenal job of it. And yet again, proving that PG-13 horror doesn't have to be bloody and gory now if that's what you need in your horror to have a good time no problems here trust me i can i can recommend lots of bloody gory films to you so can scotty right. but if you're looking for something that is just creepy and well developed and good ghost storytelling which is to be quite frank hard to do mm-hmm. in a lot of fucking north american films um this is this is hitting out of the park hands down so i'm glad you feel the same way yeah this is definitely one of my favorite uh like newer book adaptations that has been done and yeah yeah, one that i didn't think was going to be easy to pull off i i remember seeing the preview and i remember as i said i was like oh man i hope this is going to be good and i went to the theater to watch it because i was like you know what i hope it's good you know i can't believe they're releasing this in august i don't know why they do it in august and they did and that's fine 
You know, you can't always release a movie in October, a horror movie in October. I get it. Then we would just have no horror movies all year round. You have 15 billion ones in October. So I understand that. Um, but fuck, it was good. Yeah. yeah. I would go see it at theater again. I would pay full pop to go watch it again at the theater. Oh, That's absolutely. how much I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, so check it out if you haven't had a chance to. I guess we probably should have said something about spoilers because it was a 2019 film. But um, obviously you guys know we spoil movies, but I will give a, a warning for this upcoming one. We will be talking about the three Fear Street films mm-hmm. after we do a little intro about R.L. Stein and the Fear Street novels. So if you have not watched the uh, the most recent Fear Street films, uh, we understand if you want to skip over this part, uh, because we will be engaging in spoilers, much like you just saw with Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Uh, Scott and I spoil films. So for some reason, if this is your first time listening and you know, you're mad that we spoiled scary stories to tell in the dark for you. You're going to be even madder when you listen to what we talk about hey, Fear Street. So right. <laughs> proceed with caution if you have not watched the Fear Street films yet. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is I can kind of get this back up over here. There we go. So what's your history with Fear Street, Scott? Um, well, I was more the Goosebumps kid. Okay. Um, I did read a couple of Fear Street books. The problem is I don't remember which ones they are because it was so long ago. I mm-hmm. think they had to do with like the babysitters because you didn't wasn't there like a series there was a based four, off There was a four series on one young woman and her babysitting and how she grows as a character. There was four books on it. Yeah, I think I read one or two of those books and then one or two of another series of the Fear Street world. Fair enough. Fair enough. Like, so this not, is more your cup of this is like, my, what you grew up with more than I did. I definitely grew up with this. I didn't even read Goosebumps. I would that, that's funny. Wow. Book. Yeah. Um, I skipped right over that and went to Fear Street. I didn't even know Goosebumps. By the time I found Goosebumps, I had already read Fear Street. And honestly, like, yeah. there was no going back from Fear Street to Goosebumps. That's not what right, you need to no. do, right? So Fear Street is a teenage horror fiction series written by American author R.L. Stein and started in 1989. His first book was called The New Girl. In 1995, a series of books inspired by Fear Street series called The Ghosts of Fear Street was created for younger readers and more like the Goosebump books in that they featured paranormal, you know, adverse monsters, aliens, etc., and sometimes had a twist ending. R.L. Stein stopped writing Fear Street after penning the Fear Street Senior spinoff in 1999. And in the summer 2005, he brought back Fear Street books with three part of Fear Street Nights miniseries. As of 2010, over 80 million copies of Fear Street have been sold. Wow. Yeah. So as we all know, in July, there was a trilogy of films based on the franchise was released. So Fear Street books take place in the fictional town of State Shadyside, which we see in the film. And feature average teenagers older than the typical go- Goosebumps preteen. So typically in R.L. Stein books, the teenagers were anywhere between 16 and 19, sometimes 20, but usually 16 to 19, who encounter paranormal adversities. Well, some of the Fear Street novels have paranormal elements such as ghosts and others are simply murder mysteries, uh, where Goosebumps had very tame, few tame deaths. The deaths in Fear Street are often particularly in the saga and are far more gruesome with more blood and gore and violence. Um, And they also dealt with mental illness and they dealt with a lot of other things in the Fear Street series. Uh, The title of the series comes from the name of the fictional street in Shadyside, which is named after the Fear family. Their name was originally spelled F-I-F-I-E-R after being told the family was cursed and the letters could be arranged to spell fire. Simon Fear changed it to Fear F. E-A-R in the 19th century. Despite the family renaming, the curse survived and Simon and his wife Angelica bought it with them when they moved to Shadyside sometime after the Civil War. So this is going into the origins of Fear Street. So the curse continues with Benjamin and Matthew Fear sentencing an innocent girl and her mother Susanna and and Martha Good to be burned at the stake for allegedly practicing witchcraft, which is where we see some plot here that's inspired. Mm -hmm. Uh, The husband and the father, William Good, put a curse on the fears to avenge their death and bring ministry, uh, mis- misery and death to the family. Although a fire originally burned the last of the fears, the series somehow somehow surviving fears and suggests that one of the brothers survived. These events are described in the Fear Street Saga, a spinoff of the main series. So the Fear Street Saga was very historical. Uh, the final film in the Netflix really is based off of that. So 
the next the Netflix series was a love letter to the Fear Street multiple different series that existed. So as I said already, The New Girl was the first book that was published in 1989, and it was followed by many other films off of, you know, many other books based off of Fear Street. So typical teenage angst was very common in these films. Romantic relationships were very common in these films. There was a lot of references to what was hip and new at the time in these films. (laughs) Are you noticing a trend here, Scotty? I sure am. Um, There was always a twist in every single book where you thought it was something, but it ended up being something else. Um, And there was always, you know, definitely your protagonist that some survived and some did not. I still remember one scene that that described a cat being found in a a bowl, a a pot of boiling spaghetti. Um, This girl found her cat in a a pot of boiling spaghetti and her approaching up to the pot and realizing what was in it. So it was a, it was a pretty dark novel series. Uh, It did very well. It continues to do very well. So why don't we break into the films with that little bit of synopsis? Does this make a little bit more sense for the films for you, Scott? Oh, it definitely does. Like I knew a lot about the Fear Street stuff just because I had a lot of friends that read it and we talked about it back then. Um, For me at the time, uh, the reason I didn't read a lot of Fear Street is because I was reading about Horror High, which is something we'll be talking about. Oh, Horror High. Yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar with Horror High. Yeah. I was reading more of those books back then. Did you ever um, read Christopher Pike? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I, I was in a battle Pike. with one of my girlfriends about who was better, Christopher Pike or R.L. R. 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 Stein. And I think, honestly, they're both great writers. I don't... Yeah. I think R.L. Stein just had more success because his books were shorter in length, typically, yep. um, and a little bit more palatable to read. Yeah, because I think Christopher Pike also kind of hit more adult. Yeah, later, he kind of did team. that later teen stuff. So I'll let you bring us in. And yet again, there will be spoilers for these three three movies for Fear Street. So you have been warned. All right. So the first movie is Fear Street Part 1, 1994, released July 2nd, 2021. After a series of brutal slayings, a teen and her friends take on an evil force that's plagued their notorious town for centuries. Um, Yeah, so this one... uh, definitely is an homage to everything 90s Mm -hmm. um whether it's music internet video games technology Wait, are you saying there were 90 90 songs in this film yes there there were 90 90s songs in this movie (laughs) (laughs) like they uh what was like in the first 15 minutes i think seven or eight 90s songs were played like yes like oh my gosh okay you're hitting us on the head with it i get it um but also they took the 90s theme and even went as far as like referencing and homaging 90s horror films like scream now it's funny that you say that because it is but it's actually homaging the fear street books because and many a times R.L. Stein would open in his chapter with a murder like that or something sensational happening. Right. Well, and I'm then just it saying would like, flash uh, back into the story. So as much as it did definitely people who don't read who didn't read the books excessively wouldn't know that. Right. Well, right? the only reason I was comparing it to Scream is because literally the way it was filmed with the girl in yes, the wall, the killer's absolutely. right behind her and stabs her in the back, just absolutely. like Drew Barrymore. I agree. Um, no, I, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that wasn't the main inspiration for that. I think no. the main inspiration was most of R.L. Stein's novels always started, not always, a lot of them would start off with like a cliffhanger. So right. she's running, as Karen ran through the woods, she could feel the breath off of her face. She realized the man was catching up and there was nothing that she could do. She was wearing her Nikes that she, brand new Nikes that she just brought that <laughs> week. Like it was seriously like that. She had her discman that flew away with, you know, the cranberries playing. Like, I'm not kidding. That is exactly how fucking R.L. Stein wrote his shit. So like, wow. <laughs> you know, they really did use the motivation. I definitely think from the nineties, which would have made sense because the killing was around the time the screen came out in the nineties horror films. So this kid would have been inspired. Um, but yeah, definitely there was some blatant homages uh, ripoffs to Scream, but that idea of the opening with like a killer, like a, a, a dramatic scene was definitely R.L. Stein style. And oh, the yeah. overabundant of the 90s shit was something that also he would do in his books. Um, which is why yet again, if you weren't a big fan of R.L. Stein, you'd be like, what the fuck's with this shit? Like how much overdoing could you do it? But they were for the for the people that were avid fans you kind of were like all right (laughs) yeah 
that this makes takes sense. you back to reading this novel now. It was like vomiting a pop culture at the time. That makes sense because when I'm watching this, I'm going, all right, so this is Stranger Things, but in the 90s. Like, remember the 90s? Remember the 90s? Yeah. Remember the 90s? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was really what R.L. Steins would do. Now, obviously, this got turned up to super size and they motivate, they used a lot of other horror movies for, um, you know, you're not wrong in your statement. I'm not trying to say you right. are. I'm just giving another perspective of why they also did that was because of how his books were written. <laughs> like, and that makes sense. Right. Right. It's like the teenage angst piece of this that occurs within um, the main relationships. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, so much teenage angst. Like this, we should have done these films for teenage angst. Remember we did teenage angst? Holy fuck, these films could have been a perfect oh, absolutely. teenage angst film. But this was totally representing of the R.L. Stein stuff. But I did love the part where, you know, I do like some nostalgia from the 90s, probably because we were actually teenagers in the, in the 90s or preteens or whatever. And I did like the glow in the dark stuff, like the glow in the dark store, like that party favor store that that one kid works for and that or she works for. And then she has to run around and try to survive in with the glow dark stars and shit like that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, like uh because yeah i think uh her friend worked at spencer's and so yeah, yeah that's what it was spencer's or references and and yeah. she was working she was working for uh b, b dalton books right which was right. a big popular mall bookstore <laughs> like i really did love the mall feel and like the food court and that's kind of like where all the teenagers would go and hang out and like it was the cool shit to do like i'm sure you remember going to um well we had hmb music world sam the record man but whatever I don't know, music stores you had that were the big chains in the States. Yeah, like uh, Harmony House and uh, FYE and things okay. like that. And you would go and you could listen to CDs. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. You could go and like try the CD before you bought it. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, right. And, uh, and did they sell tickets there to concerts? Like you could go there and buy tickets for concerts? Yep. Uh, Hot Topic actually sold OzFest tickets. So I bought tickets to OzFest there before. Nice. And nice so like same thing right it was definitely made for our age group yeah. i feel like they went all right who is old enough to read harl stein books and like i don't know has maybe some nostalgia for the 90s people in their 30s excellent here you go right <laughs> <laughs> um but i i did think as i said there was a lot of teenage angst kind of the twist and the turn they used the shady side piece of it how shady side had all this bad luck and sunny side was you know where all the good stuff was and Obviously, in 1994, uh, R.L. Stein was not writing about um, anything other than heterosexual relationships. Right. Um, maybe once in a while, a character would be bi curious, but it was never a focus in any of his books. So when they did that, I was like, this is very much for a relevant audience of today. Um, maybe yeah. More Though, sexual preferences. So I wish that, like, just my personal preference, I wish they wouldn't have, like, tried to play it coy and be like, oh, my, uh, you see, she's breaking up with Sam, and then it pans over, and you see a football player kissing on a girl, and she gets all mad. She walks away, so it's making you think, oh, it's her boyfriend Sam, and then it's a yeah. girl. It's like, yeah, you're. That just seems kind of cliche with the whole yeah. like lesbian lover thing, like having a woman with the uh, what do you call that androgynous name? Yes, yeah. So you're right, Scott. You're right. Yeah. Like, I just felt that, like, that's just kind of overplayed, but I'm like, you know, it's nothing I'm going to hate on. I'm just kind of just like, okay, I think you're 100% right. And I think that's a valid, like, they had to be like, oh, no, we got right. you. We fooled it's you. It's really the girl. You know? <laughs> like, it was testing. Are you homophobic or not? Right. Um, I just kind of, I just kind of eye rolled. I'm like, I, I, I. <laughs> yeah, it was, I agree with you. It was a little cheese cheese there. Um, but I did. I, I did like how their relationship progressed. I was listening to Horror for Dummies. By the way, Horror for Dummies is an awesome podcast. Uh, you can find them on the Padded Room Network, and it's Tim Davis and Daniel, and they're awesome. Lucy. They give they give me a Scott Crawford. They certainly do every single time. So they did a review of Fear Street, and Tim mentioned how he felt uncomfortable watching um, one of the sexual scenes with the young ladies because they do look rather young. Mm. um they are actually by the way they're in their 20s uh they're all of age but did you feel like i didn't really think of it i was like oh yeah they're just in their bra and panties yeah i i didn't out. think anything of it either right like i was like okay like i get it you got it because in the fear street novels he did talk about people making out he and usually it wouldn't go and what was really interesting a nice little razzle dazzle touch to this rarely would they go all the way that he would indicate that they had sex 
Right. So usually he would end it off in like they were making out in a car, blah, blah, blah. And then like kind of trail off to be like, oh, she pushed her hand up against the window as it steamed up. And then the new chapter would start. The next day at school, Cindy was thinking about last night with Max in the car. So it would always kind of like leave it. So you kind of could explore what happened. And I kind of liked how he did that with both the kids in the bathroom. Yes. the young lady and the gentleman the kid by himself yeah. <laughs> um and the two young ladies and came back as like did every and he says something like did everyone finish or something like that or right, he was on? just like did everyone uh what was the term yeah but yeah basically he was in that did everyone go all the way he's like i did too like <laughs> when he was by himself like that was total rl stein fucking right like whoever made these films was an rl stein fan i will definitely give them credit because that was and yet again a little tie into the to the move to the books and none of these movies were based off of any one books i thought they were and i was like well maybe i just didn't read that book because i don't remember this and then i went back into it i said oh no like what they're doing is they're just basically making a book into film yeah, and they're, they're kind of building the world they are right so there was some nice little things that they did tie in that if you did read the fear street sagas or the fear street books you got you know the train of thought that they had um the kills in this and the grocery yeah. store like they i knew that they killed people in fear street books i knew that would happen but fuck was i shocked yeah they do not shy away from the gore in this like no i was because uh, i went in going okay it's probably going to be a uh, cutaway mm. and you might see like a dead body with blood later or something yeah. like that no like they they get pretty violent with some of the kills and uh one of the kills in this with the bread slicer may make one of my best of uh best kills of the year because that is that a kill is of the a, year to beat that is a kill uh, of that the year is a messed up scene yeah the the one i referred to earlier in another 2021 i think could be comparable um but that one is it's and yet again this reflects rl stein fear street novels like he would talk about graphic kills and characters would die who you didn't really know whether someone was safe or not right. and i thought that was really well done like i really i i thought the filming of this was high quality um it is very highly 90 centric it is very teenage angsty it does remind you of a of a less good stranger things but that's what our old stein was actually i like <laughs> i like this better than stranger things oh do you yeah oh okay interesting yep. i'll say i think it's just more because it's more horror yeah and to be honest it's quicker it doesn't drag out like stranger yeah. things kind of fucking drags it here well it's because they got a tv on and on, right? it's because it's a tv series and netflix wants you to binge every episode and i don't like when series drag their stories out give me an hour and a half movie boom two hour movie I, boom i agree and you know what that's why they were able to do these movies and get all that shit in that they needed to and yeah. it wasn't dragged out right it was very much like a book and then it leaves it on a cliffhanger which rl stein did mm -hmm. frequently in his books especially if there was a tie-in um, anything you want to add for 94 before we jump into 1978? Um, just that, you know, I may not have read a lot of the Fear Street books, but I still, if anybody has is like on the fence about watching these because you haven't read any of the books, go into it just knowing it's going to be a fun movie based in the 90s because this is a very fun 90s style horror film. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. My name for all these films are bubblegum horror. Yes. Um, easy to digest, easy to watch. You know, you're looking at about an hour and 47 minutes. It is a little bit longer than a regular film would be. Um, but if you have Netflix, it's worth it. It's high quality money that gets yeah. put into this it's movie. It's Netflix just know, money. <laughs> yeah, just know it's it's going to be very teenage angsty and it's going to be very like, oh, 90s throwback. And it's and it's bubblegum. It's bubblegum yeah. horror and it's representative of the free, Fear Streets books. And this book particularly um, looked at the books that R.L. Stein wrote in present day. So he would do present day books. He would do books from the 70s or 60s, 50s. And then he would do books from the Fear Street saga. So I even like how he did that with all of the series of the three movies too. Or these people right. did that as well. They acknowledged each of the generations that he wrote a lot in and, you know, connected them into the film. So let's get into Fear Street Part 2. All right. So Fear Street Part 2, 1978, released July 9th, 2021. A summer of fun turns into a gruesome fight for survival as a killer terrorizes Camp Nightwing in the cursed town of Shadyside. 
Um, now, this one is definitely the movie that is an homage to 80s camp slasher films. Absolutely. Like if you are a fan of Friday the 13th, Sleepaway Camp, the burning check this movie out because this is like tons of nods and references and like it's got like and it's just like in the 90s version 1978 they have a lot of very popular 70s songs playing throughout it carry on the way you were son there'll be peace when you are gone lay your weary head to rest don't you cry no more <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah uh honestly i think this is my favorite of the three um oh, yeah i think it, most people like this one the most to be honest with you yep yeah, because this does uh this definitely hits the whole camp sla- 80s slasher vibe that scotty loves mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and i do love absolutely love the soundtrack uh once again they do jam a lot of popular music in like short succession but I yeah. like the story of this one because it's kind of uh, it ties into the 1994 one with where it starts off. And it's the two main girls, one uh, well, the main girl and her brother and her girlfriend, Sam, who's right now possessed. And they you know are trying to figure out how to basically do an exorcism, get rid of the what's causing her to be possessed. And they end up having to hear the story of the one lone survivor from the 70s. And then it kind of does this, then this whole movie is basically one long flashback. And like the story, I like the whole idea of like where you find this like cave system underneath the camp where Sarah Fear was part of her body was buried and Mm -hmm. where ritualistic summoning has been happening and how you find out why certain shady siders end up going crazy and becoming killers. And I love the story and how they do this one. Um, I was kind of curious, does this like, does this feel like a Fear Street book to you? Absolutely. This is reflective of his 70s writing. Um, And this continues on with what R.L. Stein would do with certain books that connected to each other is that he would start off with one assumption in the first story, and then he would flush it out. So it wasn't what you thought at all by the end. Mm. Now, for those of us who knew the story, I always knew what Sarah Fear's deal actually was. Sarah Fear is in the original books, but she is not the main character, as you can tell Matthew and some other people are. Um, but definitely there is a Sarah Fear. And I knew right away what the deal was. But I think for people who didn't know, this story does a very good job of building on it. And I'll be honest, I think the acting's better in this. We do yeah. have some actors from Stranger Things in this one that uh, aren't in the first one or the second one. And I don't find this one as teenage angsty. I find yep. it a little less annoying in that area. No, I think that there's only like more teenage drama with like the bullying yes. and the picking on each other, but not angsty. No, it the the and the romantic relationship piece of it, like we have some established couples. We have like a gentleman that's interested in a young lady that he's like a counselor and she's like at the last year of being a camper. So I'm assuming it's like 15 and 17. Yeah. We're going to go with that as 15 and 17. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Um, Which I think it would have been like, I could see yet again, R.L. Stein would have a relationship like that of the senior camp counselor, the junior camp counselor, liking the senior camper. Um, But then when they go underneath and they find the tunnels and shit that's very much rl steiny some of the kind of the jump scares the creepy shit that happens with the nurse all of that stuff is how he would write his book okay um the bullying that would be included into it um only pr- p- killing the people that were from shady Sh- shady side not sunnyville um yeah. would it definitely be it like you feel really bad for those kids who get basically massacred Oh, yeah, because this one, uh, this one definitely, like, this is where, like, it kind of veers away from most typical 80s camp slashers, where it ends up being, like, older kids or camp counselors being ones getting killed. In yeah. this story, it's young teens getting killed. I mean, they don't show the kills on screen for them, but, like, they're brutally murdered. Yeah, yeah. Like, you can hear the noises and stuff, what's going on, because it's basically an axe-wielding killer. And yep. like you hear the swings and everything. And it's, I was shocked when they actually killed off like the one kid during the color wars thing that that was going on. The, the yeah. guy that was like the uh, prison guard. Yeah. I wasn't surprised because yet again, R.L. Stein, 
books, right? He would go there in the Fear Street saga. So it's interesting because slowly what he did was 1994 was very much like his, you know, Fear Street movies that were based in the 90s or the 80s. This one was more reflective of stuff he wrote in the 70s, but was starting to dip into the saga, was starting to dip back to that history piece, um, which even though the third film, I think a lot of people don't like as much. And I'll be honest, I don't like it as much either, but it really represents the Fear Street saga, uh, which was the origins of Fear Street, how the stories were told, um, you know, how everything led up to be to what it was. But back to this one, I think the characters in this one are personally the best. I yeah. really like Cindy. I really like Sheila. I really like Tommy. I feel bad when Tommy turns. Mm-hmm. You know, you feel bad for him when that happens. I think they did a really good job. I, I even like Nick's character. I I feel like you cared about everybody. Yeah. Like you actually felt like you were at a camp and this was this wholesome experience. And the Shady Siders and Sunnydale people were trying to get along. And then all this fucking chaos was happening. I felt it was a great movie. And I think this is probably a standalone in the series for people. Yeah, and I liked because one one thing we didn't really bring up in the 1994 version is uh, the main girl's little brother is obsessed with all the different murders that have happened yes. throughout Shady Side's history and talks about these massacres. And this is one of those massacres that happened. Where in the 1994 one, it's like a beginning of a massacre that gets kind of stopped. And in this one, it's playing out and it's the entire massacre, which is just like, I think there was what, 14 deaths or something like that. Like this guy just killed like so many people in just one night. Yeah. And like, it just kind of like puts it in focus. Like, okay, these are horrible events in Shady Side's history. Yeah. I I kind of like how they play that out. I agree. I agree. I think what I like most about this film is at the end, after Nick gives uh, Siggy CPR and saves her, and and I didn't think Siggy was going to die. I didn't think it was going to be, I thought it was going to be, Siggy was going to, sorry, I thought Siggy was going to die and Cindy was going to live. Right. Right. But you realize later (laughs) that wasn't the case. And that starts to tie into the saga already. That (laughs) twist of Nick intervening and preventing, um, Siggy from dying is very much like a twist that R.L. Stein would do towards the end of his film. And they kind of put together about the witch theory, about the hand being removed, the fact that it's under the tree or the body's under the tree at the Shady Side Mall or the hands under the tree at the Shady Side Mall. And at the end, we see Dina, who with the blood has a vision where she's in 1666 as Sarah Fear. And it leads right back into the to the Fear Street saga. I thought that was clever. So what did you think, like, as leading from this end of this film into the third one? Um, I thought this was a, once again, a good tiebreaker that, or not tiebreaker, cliffhanger mm-hmm. that uh, leads into what we will find out is, like, the history behind this. Because um, they do a very good job of kind of giving you, like, flashbacks whenever one of the characters touches uh, part of Sarah Fear. So I think this uh, leads into 1666 in a pretty interesting way. Yeah, for sure. I think it was, I think you're right that this is very much a fun movie, much like the first one. Um, It's easy to watch, easy to digest. Would you recommend this one over the first one? Uh, Yes. I think this one, especially because if you're a fan of like the 80s slashers, this is like totally that style of film. Okay, cool. Awesome. So I guess we'll, finish off the the third one because i agree i think the second one is great i think a lot of people will dig it um probably more than the third but that's okay let's talk about the third all right so fear street part three 1666 uh released july 16th on 2021 in 1666 a colonial town is gripped by a witch hunt that has deadly consequences for centuries to come while teenagers are in, in 1994 try to put an end to their town's curse before it is too late um yeah this one i think you and i both have the uh complaint that reusing characters or reusing actors yeah i don't really know why they did that i do you think it was a budget thing like i don't know enough about filmmaking (laughs) or was it because they were trying to be like Um, familiar i I don't know i am not sure why they did this like i I know it's not a budget thing because i mean it's netflix netflix has plenty of money 
Um, so I'm not sure if it's maybe to kind of like make it, so I forget what the main character is from 1984, what her name Dina. is, but Dina, Dina, like maybe trying to say like, she's kind of like Sarah Fear in a way, like if she was Sarah yeah, Fear in 1966 and there's like a correlation. Oh yeah, I get what you're saying. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a really good connection. Um, and then Sam, like, obviously I don't know, like the, the lesbian love affair. I don't know, like that would definitely that maybe could have happened in the Fear Street Saga books because it would have been shocking for the Fear Street Saga. But this definitely represented the whole concept of this colony town and the idea of the witch hunt and the witch trials, which was based around Fear Street. We did read about how people were burned at the stake yeah. um, and the Fear Street you know, legend became from that. And I, I don't think this one is the strongest of the films. Like, I think that it is... Like the fact that they have like an individual who's black and then an individual who's Asian, that would never happen. You would never, have, it would all be white people yes. living in this fucking village, right? So that was the only thing that I was kind of like, I don't get why you're reusing the actors, but I think your point to they were recreating the characters um, was good. And I think one of the creepiest scenes in this, which was very much Fear Street Saga, was the children having their eyes gouged out yes. in the church by the preacher yeah 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 that was disturbing because i i didn't expect that to be shown like i didn't know what was going on like i obviously you've seen the preacher and his eyes are gouged yeah. out and i'm going okay what the hell's going on here and then you just see all the kids with theirs gouged out and I'm going oh damn and these were yeah. young kids too they were they were all the kids in the you know village or whatever it was and you know, I think that Tommy guy was in it and he played such a dick in this one. Like he was like dirty and gross and yeah. like all about the sexual assault. Like he was just a completely different character than he was in the, in the, you know, 1978, he was still kind of a hero that kind of turned a little bit. Um, but I did, I did really appreciate this one for the amount of 1966 they had in it. It was very accurate to the Fear Street writing saga um very much about like the love affair that would have occurred yet again stopping before sex occurred and then we skip the you know the betrayal yeah the betrayal and i think it is the good family i think they kept yep. that name right yep. so it is yeah, the it good is the, family yeah because nathan good i think is his name nathan good does the betrayal of sarah fear and she takes the blame which would have happened you know a, definitely a man's word would have been taken over a woman's word mm -hmm. and she's killed and her friends you know bury her and try to give her this proper burial and then it flashes back to 1994 and i think this ending scene of 1994 is really where this movie picks up yes. um you have that big showdown in the mall with all of the antagonists which i thought was pretty entertaining like i thought that was like the best part of the film personally for me yeah because they find out that the good family is behind all of this and each generation learns like that they can use the witchcraft style powers to give themselves a position of power in society right right and yeah so I you get the mayor really of impressive. yeah because you get the mayor who's the brother of the sheriff in shadyvale and you get the mayor, mayor of uh sunnyvale who is the brother so it's like they use the power for him to become mayor use the power for him to become sheriff it's like it's interesting like how i'd never expected them to be the villains it really did follow the Arl Stein writings in the sense that it built on each story right so you're learning more about the mystery you're figuring out how people came together and then you have the conclusion at the end right where it's like okay you know how is stuff now what what is what what do we actually see we know that the good family is evil and they've been using their basically influence to punish shady side and Sarah Fear has been trying to reach out this entire time and has been framed so yeah it really does give that kind of nice bookmark. I, I did love how, you know, they kind of solved the problem a little bit with trying to get all the villains in the same cage at the, at that given time. And I think that's incredible, like very much like the novel and, and the ending is very much like it flashed back from the fear street saga and it finished off at probably what would have been R.L. Stein's final novel, which is getting rid of the curse of shady side. Right. So, which I can't remember now if that's, if that did happen, because I read the book so long ago, but it was a, kind of a perfect little ending to it. But again, very bubblegum horror-ish. 
Oh, absolutely. But it's, this is definitely, I think, the weaker of the three. But I mm-hmm. like that last half is what makes this one still good because the way they tie the story up and the intense like final confrontation happens. Now, I know you like historical stuff. Did you enjoy this historical piece of this? Yes, I really did. I I wanted more of it, to be honest, like because they only it's like only half the movie like and the movie's two hours long so it's only an hour and when it switched over to 1994 i'm going oh that was it i wanted a little more (laughs) that's interesting because i wasn't sure you would feel about the historical piece because it wasn't overly accurate it was pretty like i almost wanted them to post cell phone start texting like it was just really like (laughs) i mean it it did feel like just too uh uh, high quality, almost like it felt too much. I felt like they were doing a reenactment at some yes. fucking historical site. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it was just, it was, and it was really the different cultures. Like this is not a case where something was culturally diverse. Okay. It was all fucking white people. Like right. that's, that's who was there. And if there was a person of color, they were probably being treated like shit. It's probably what was happening. Right. So that was the only thing in this film that I thought was a little silly, but you know what? I yeah, can forgive I- that. Yeah, because I was going to say, because that's the issues I have with it, but like the story I, I was kind of hooked into, just like the history part. Right, absolutely. So would you recommend the series as a whole? Like, I feel like it ties very much into the books and being a fan of the books, I think it did represent it. What, like, would you recommend for people to watch the entire series? Uh, yes, I think these are three films that I would highly recommend people watch for if they're trying to like fill out their 2021 lists. Because this is, uh, they're all very entertaining to one extent or another. They're not like, some people really love them in our community, but I am about, you know, I think they're good. I don't think they're great, but yeah, they're good. They're very entertaining films. I would agree with you. I think they represented the Fear Street movies well, our Fear Street books well. And I think if you're an R.L. Stein fan, you'll probably have a little bit more of an enjoyment with them because of your love of the books. But understand that these were books that were written for teenagers that have been made into a movie. Like this isn't going to be St. Maud. This isn't going to be the dark and the wicked. This is going to be very much a bubble gum into the dark level horror film that's going to come out. So as long as you go into it, expecting that you're going to have a good time with it. Now for our out of the dark segment, what children's horror story would we like to see made into a movie? Do you have a story that you would like to see made into a movie? Um, I actually kind of, kind of went into what I was talking about earlier with horror high, uh, the author, I'd like to see, because uh, the author was Nicholas Adams, uh, Horror High is definitely like a low-budget version of Fear Street in a way. Yeah, but I guess so, yeah. I, there, it's only an eight-book series, but they were very cheesy and of their time, but I would love to see them turned into like a mini series of some sort or mini movie like these, because they definitely have that teenage angst of the 90s and like very feel very fear street to me like it was definitely uh, around the time that fear street was super popular and they just wanted someone else to cash in on it but i feel the movies could or i feel there could be some movies that could do do the books justice awesome were there continuous characters in that uh yes i believe there is like i believe like uh i can't remember any of the characters names because like i say it's been so long and i'm very fucking forgetful but uh like i think it you know one's like main character starts off in one book and then like ancillary characters get their own book in the next next book and the next book and stuff like that so it's not like all just one main character focus it's just all these teens at the school okay cool i think that would be fun i think that would definitely be something that netflix could jump into yeah, I totally could see them doing this, especially right, since Fear Street became so popular. Yeah, and, and it's done well, I think. It's had pretty good reception. It has like a pretty high approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes for a horror movie. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think they're pretty good films and it'd be interesting to see Horror High. I remember hearing about Horror High and I think there was even a TV show that was made at one point. Oh, like a cartoon. Hmm, I did not know that. I think so. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm thinking of something else, but I do recall the series of books being made. Um, for me, it would be the Babysitter series by R.L. Stein. I would love nice. to see the ongoing saga of Jenny. Uh, Jenny Jefferson is the babysitter that goes through all four books. And all four books are actually very, very different. And they were released, respectively, uh, 1989, 1991, 1993, and 1995. So I would love the opportunity to watch that character change as each story comes because there's some stories where she's the protagonist and there's some where she's kind of the antagonist um and it's it's really really interesting the arch that they take actually when i found out that rl stein movies the fear street saga was going to be or the fear street movies were going to be 
made into films, I was really hoping they were going to do the babysitter. Um, but they didn't, which is fine, but I would absolutely love to see that. And I guess we'll have to remember when, when our episode comes out to do a poll on our page or just a Facebook question of what movie would you like to see? What story from your childhood, what horror story would you like to see made into a film? Um, yeah, that'd be a great idea. And it'd be interesting to see what other people would like to see brought to the screen, either through Netflix or shutter or through theater. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, when it comes to this Babysitter series, uh, the director, I forget his name, of the Fear Street book uh, movies says he would love to continue just building up uh, Fear Street movies and just doing more Fear Street movies. Well, I can see why. He did a really good job of the series and it was very enjoyable. And, you know, for what it was, yet again, you have to walk into these films knowing what they are, right? They're fluffy right. Fear Street films. They're not to be taken seriously. Um, they're based on teenage angst books. So know that it's like if you, you know, maybe Christopher Pike, or maybe a Christopher Christopher Bike book will come out too. That, that would, would be, be cool. really interesting, yeah. right? Who knows? Like there's kind of a genre that, you know, with scary stories to tell in the dark and the Fear Street books being successful, that maybe we'll see more of these in the future. So yeah, I mean I'm hoping to because yeah, like the, like you said, this is kind of our teenage years and this is kind of what we grew up on. It would be kind of fun to see them represented on the screen. Absolutely. Well, thank you as always for joining us on our first episode back after our nice little vacation. Um, next episode will be on sororities because we're going back to September. I say going back to school. I'm the only one that goes back to school because I work right. and live within <laughs> academics. But uh, we'll be talking about some sorority films, some that we know very well and one that we've never even seen or heard of, I think, before. So hopefully it's not as bad as that prom movie I made us oh, watch. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> but there's no promises, Scott. It may be super shit. We'll see well. how it goes. You know, um, I'm willing to, I'm willing to take the bullet if need be. Yeah, just don't show anybody <laughs> else the film. Okay. Don't torture anyone else with it if it's really shitty. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and we'll also be back with more top fives. Uh, we have a couple of guests lined up. Uh, our top five episodes are extremely popular. A lot of people want to guest on them. A lot of people want to be on them. There's a break for controllers up cards down. Uh, we will not have a new episode of that just due to Scott's schedule. He's very busy this month. He's got a lot going on. Uh, it was hard enough to record Friday Nightmares, let alone controllers up cards down. So a yeah. new episode of that will come in September. And yeah, I can't think of anything else that's pressing that we need to let everyone know about. No, I can't think of anything else. Uh, yeah, I'll say we'll just, uh, we are back to our regular schedule. So, you know, our episodes will be dropping every two weeks again. So it's good to be back. Good uh, to be back for sure. It was a nice um, break, but yeah, I'm ready to record again. Absolutely. And also uh, excited for Candyman. Yes. Yeah, hopefully. Now, I don't think we'll have watched Candyman next time we record. No, but, but uh, the next episode after that. Yeah, maybe. by September, um, mid-September, we'll definitely have watched Candyman. So it'll be interesting to see our thoughts on that one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it and can't wait to talk about it, whether whether I like it or not. We will, we shall see, but I have a feeling Yeah, I will. it will be interesting because you really, I'm going to rewatch the first one before I go because you and I got into a heated debate about it before. We so did, I yeah. think <laughs> I need to rewatch it and see. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see how I feel rewatching it um, because I, yeah, I, I think, yeah, it will be just be interesting. It'll be interesting yeah. to see where my thought falls. So I guess until next time, uh, you can find us on the Legion Podcast Network. Please hit subscribe. Also, a big welcome back to Kill the Cast. By this point, they should have released, hopefully, their uh, most recent episode. So big welcome back to Jerry, Jay, and Kenneth. Yay, welcome um, back, guys. Happy to see you guys back. Happy to see that you're doing well. And we look forward to sharing the feed with you again. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else, Scotty. So what else do you have to say to the good people? Until next time, friends, remember to wipe your windows. <laughs> Unpleasant dreams. <laughs> That's funny. Bye.